Here. 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 Thank you. Okay, our first item of business is public comments. And it looks like we have three people who are signed up for comments. And I'm going to call on Brian Cooper uh, for our first commenter. Brian? Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Cooper. I'm um, Kane Township Supervisor from here. Here today, for almost having the show on the council. But also, we are having our fifth page state supervisor, Turkey, at the lot. I'm counting up to that. Opportunity to give a public thank you for work and to my talent for supporting a handicapped chef program. First phase of four phases. Okay, hey, thank you, Brian. Uh, next, we'll have Jeremiah Weber want to comment on boat fishing. So, yeah, I can. Absolutely. And we'd like to keep the comments to around five minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start off. My name is Jeremiah Weber. I own Boondock Boat Fishing Adventures and Boondock Outdoors. I am the largest manufacturer of U.S. made bow fishing equipment in the United States. I ship all over the world. This is my job, and I've been doing it for over 30 years of my life bow fishing. Um, I'd like to start off thanking you all for having me here today and allowing me to speak. The new proposed regulations. We, we have came a long way with them since September, whenever they were first proposed, but I do believe that some of those regulations do still need to have some wording changes done in them to make them beneficial for all. Um, I'd also like to ask that when you're called upon to vote on these regulations later today, that you make your decision based off of facts, verified facts on documented complaints and not emotions or any personal reasons. Um, the proposed regulation that we have, the first one would be the, I believe, the trout regulations in special, special trout waters, special regulation trout waters. I'm not opposed to shutting down or fishing in trout, some trout waters, but one of your largest competitors to your native breeding trout would probably be sucker fish sucking up their eggs and eating them and small. Um, cats or bullhead catfish. Those are shootable species for us, which actually help your native breeding trout to survive if we're allowed in there. I don't know of anybody who's going into a bunch of fly fishermen in a, in a special regulated trout stream and shooting fishing while they're doing it. So I don't 
see any conflicts there. I've tried to reach out to your commission through right to know acts and have gotten zero information back from any complaints about bow fishing in general or anything to do with bow fishing. So I'm not sure where a lot of these regulations are coming from other than maybe someone had a personal interaction that this started from and they came to somebody who started these regulations. Um, I like to state also that I'm retired law enforcement and I like to base my Interpretation to the single wardens, which why well, put that on them? If you have that word intentional and repeated lighting, it saves a lot on both sides. We know what we can do, and they know what they can buy it. That is for a violation for the decimal level on a generator. I am not displeased with 90 decibels. That is fine. My decibel on my 3000 watt on the generator is between 64 and 68 decibels. I do believe there needs to be a better specification on where that's measured from. Right now, you're saying the intersecting point of the transom gunnel and your porter starboard gunnel, four feet off the water. That is right on the corner of the boat. That will be right at a generator. If the generator is on a boat fishing boat, it is either port corner or starboard corner on the back. Very few have them on raised generator racks, but either way, that's going to be right at the head and exhaust of the generator. I feel better measuring point would probably be about six feet behind the boat, center of the transom, four feet off the water. Could easily be done with a push pull type stick where you reached out six foot long, set on your boat and measure that. Nobody who you're going to be playing in contact with or who's going to make a complaint noise complaint about your boat is going to be standing on the corner of your generator here. But I will also say my Honda generator, we could stand two feet away from and we could be having a conversation right now and it would not annoy us. But once again, intentional and repeated lighting would be a much better way to state that in that regulation that you're looking to change. Um, I'd like to ask one thing to you guys think, has there ever been any type of a documented safety issue with even the use of lights or anything to do with bow fishing? Has there ever been an accident involving bow fishing? Uh, I understand we're here in final rulemaking where you guys will make a vote most likely on these regulations today. I'm asking for these to be tabled if possible, and I'd like to see a roundtable committee made involving some of the commissioners, some of the law enforcement agents, and some actual bow fishers from here in Pennsylvania. We could put a good board together, we could take a year, and we could come up with a regulation that would suit everybody. And it, there's none of these regulations that's an emergency to pass today. There's no safety concerns. There's nothing here that, once again, is an emergency that needs to be passed today. And I think that I'd like to also ask the question, have any of you bow fished? I know you probably won't raise hands. I'm willing to guess that nobody sitting at this board has bow fished, but we all know what happens when we assume. But I'd also like to ask the question, if you bow fished at night off of a boat with lights, Myself and Jordan Miller from Nocturnal Addiction Boat Fishing, who couldn't be here today because we had a, a week's notice to prepare for this, and he had a multi thousand dollar trip that he was on that he could not pass. Him and I would like to extend an invitation to any of the commissioners and any of the law enforcement agencies in this room. You have a free boat ride on our boat during our charter services. All you need to do is contact us. We will happily take you out and let you experience what boat fishing actually is, because we believe that there's a lot of misconceptions with our sport. The proverbial shooting fish in a barrel is not what happens. Uh, it's very difficult. You may see pictures online of guys with 100 fish on their boat. Those guys are professionals. Okay. My average charter, I take out four men, and they average between four and eight to 12 fish, depending on how good they are in a four hour period. Um, one moment, I'm sorry. Another fact I'd like to push towards is we've, we've continually asked for Northern Snakehead 
to be added to our shootable species here in Pennsylvania as, an, as a rapidly growing aquatic invasive species here in Pennsylvania. They are definitely in Delaware water basins. They're definitely in the Susquehanna water basin now on the lower end. Um, we keep getting pushed off for misidentification by catch issues with both in. Um, I understand both in is a native species here in Pennsylvania, but I will also state most other I've traveled border to border coast to coast in both first in my life. Um, literally just came back last night at 7 p.m. from Kentucky, drove in nine and a half hours, and I got up this morning at five o'clock in the morning to drive here from boat fishing. But both in is a shootable species in almost every other state I've ever been in. I understand a few years ago we had it on a candidate species list. It is no longer on a candidate species list. I encounter 70 to 80 both in a night in Glendale Lake up in Cambria County. It's they're polluted. Um, I'm not saying that you need to allow both in to be shot. I see no purpose for not allowing them to be, considering they're on the same species list down at the bottom of the season and crew limits, where you're allowed 50 per person per day with any other angling method. So if you go out and catch 50 both in a day with rod and reel, you can take every one of them home and kill them. The misidentification with snakehead. They are a similar fish. Anybody who knows what they're doing will not misidentify that fish. And the problem is you're also relying on people with rod and reel. You guys in your regulations right now, you're recommending immediate kill of any snakehead that are caught by regular angling methods, I believe. Is that correct, Mr. Warner? Okay. So you're relying on the average person for knowing the difference even when they throw up on the bank with a rod and reel. So for, I believe the biologist Cook or Fisheries, yeah, I think his last name was Cook, or Coon, I'm sorry, in the last meeting made statement that he was worried about bycatch of bullfin. And he was also worried about misidentification. And uh, he also made a statement in there, and I'm not sure if he intended that bow fishermen would remove snakehead from different lakes to help it prosper us. Or if he meant other fishing groups, but I will tell you, 99% of both fishermen out there are here to take invasive species out of the waterways, not to spread them. Catch and release groups as such that have been growing in popularity down in Maryland and Virginia, those would be much more likely to try and move an invasive species to help them profit or prosper from it than we would. Um, his last final statement about the reason why we would not be allowed to have snakehead shot would be, he said that down in the, the area where the ocean and snakehead territories overlap, which he's a biologist or species specialist, I'm not, but I've never seen a bowfin down in that area at all. But even if they do overlap, he said that targeting a snakehead by bow fishermen would not reduce the population of snakehead because their compensatory reproduction would not allow that. So if there was an accidental bycatch of both in, or if you allowed both in to be a shootable species for us, how would that affect the both in's population if it will not affect the snakehead population? These are all things that need brought to light, gentlemen, and you guys can reach out to me in any way possible. I can help you make decisions on this. And once again, I'm asking you to table this off. It's not an emergency situation. And we can actually put a true round table together of people knowledgeable in this subject, take you all out, bow fishing. I would love to take every one of you out to let you experience it, to actually have educated decisions on what you're making and making about. Once again, thank you for letting me speak today and feel free to reach out to me. Okay, thank you, Mr. Weber. Okay, next for public comment, Tom Wall. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm here to talk a little bit about muskies, uh, basically east of the Susquehanna. All right. Thank you all for uh, allowing me the time, and uh, I appreciate it. My name is Tom Long. I'm here with Matt Rysick. We're long-time muskie anglers that reside in the southeast section of the state. We belong to Muskies, Inc., uh, Chapter 50. In 2004, together with Chapter 50, 
we started working to improve muskie fishing east of the Susquehanna. We had limited lakes to work with, and we'd grown tired of driving two and a half hours to fish for the fish 10,000 casts of purebred muskie. One of the first things we did was we reached out to biologist Mike Kaufman, who has since retired. Mike was pivotal in making some of the changes to our section. He supported us in the pursuit to make uh, muskie fishing better. The first lake that Mike gave us permission to stock was Marsh Creek Lake. Marsh Creek had had tiger muskies in it, but anybody that knows about these fish know that tiger muskies are a very frustrating target. Now, Marsh Creek was stocked with purebred muskies for five consecutive years, and we had immediate results that were extremely successful. Marsh Creek is now a destination for muskie anglers, not only from all over the state, but from the surrounding states. Another successful endeavor that we were involved with was the Cabela's program. In conjunction with the state who supplied us the muskies and the minnows, we started a purebred muskie holdover program based on the idea of releasing less larger muskies would be more successful than releasing the smaller muskies in large numbers. This program was very successful and we added several lakes and rivers to our stocking program. Lakes like Nakamixon, Tuscarora, Archer Creek, the Schuylkill River, the Delaware River, the Lehigh River, and Blue Marsh. The state also supported us in conjunction and stocked those lakes. Our program was very successful. However, today our program is struggling. We lost a lot of time with COVID. It seems to have put us back to where we started. We took on a larger lake like Nakamixon, and we had had early success with this lake. Mike Kaufman had done a lake study on it early, and the results were excellent. The lake has true trophy potential. However, it's been extremely expensive to do a lake that size. Now, the state had stopped stocking this lake as well, and almost all the lakes in our area, the state is now no longer stocking. We've tried to maintain the stocking of Marsh Creek and Lake Nakamixon, but the numbers we're seeing are down. We feel this is a result of delayed mortality, fishing pressure with the size limits. A lot of fish are just taken home. Uh, you know, it's a trophy fish, so when you see it, sometimes people just take it home. We feel like, again, musky fishing has never been more popular than it is today, and our section of the state needs support from your stocking program. The fact that several lakes were removed from the stocking program we just don't understand. We would like those lakes reinstated um, now, uh, and hopefully immediately you guys can do that. Uh, we've been working on this for years, and uh, you don't get any younger in this, that's for sure. Um, now, we have donated equipment to the state since 2007, uh, like snap feeders, uh, minnows, pallets. Since 2004, our club has donated all the time to do float stocking, almost all the muskies in the area. We've donated countless hours and time, like kids program, lake cleanups. Um, we've raised money at local shows for the stocking of purebred muskies. The total cost of muskies that we've stocked to date is $170,000. That's from a small club of 50 guys with 25 active members. Wow. Why, uh, why are we getting less basically now when the popularity and pressure is higher than it's ever been? Um, our section of the state also buys more than half of the muskies they have sold. If you look at the numbers on the map I provide you, it shows the areas, the lakes that we've been involved with. And if you look at the numbers of stamps sold in those areas, it's over half of what Pennsylvania sells. With that kind of success, the stocking of muskies shouldn't be left up to a small club. Most of the anglers buying the stamps don't even know about our club. With the popularity of fish being at its highest levels, the fact that the muskie stamp sales in our section are so high, we simply ask that you guys help us out and reinstate the stocking of those lakes. Um, with the quality of fish that you guys are now raising, it's incredible. Uh, and we would just like to benefit from this. 
And it really seems like, you know, I started this in 2003. And I just wanted better muskie fishing for purebred muskies. Not tiger muskies, but purebred because they're just a different species. And what we've noticed is we, we've had a lot, the state has now adapted a lot of the principles that we started with, which were bigger fish, less bigger fish, you know, for stocking and you have better results. It seems like the, the eastern part, particularly east of the Susquehanna, doesn't get as many muskies and it never has. And now we're, you know, we've been involved and we have worked a lot with the state and done a lot of things. And we're just wondering, what do we have to do to get these fish? We've showed that they work. And originally we thought the water was too warm. That's what, basically what we were told. But the fish have thrived, okay? Uh, Marsh Creek is a destination. It's not a lake anymore. It's a destination for a musky angler. So we're just asking that you guys jump back in and help us out. You know, and, and reinstate those lakes. All right. Thank you. Hey, thank you. This is Christy. All right. Moving on. I'm going to turn the floor over to Colonel Clyde Warner, who is going to make recognize some very very worthy staff. Clyde. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So. Uh, this morning we have uh, four officers with us that we're going to recognize uh, for for different awards today. The first of which I'm going to start with is the Jerry Griner Environmental Protection Award. Uh, this year, 2021 recipient is Rachel Turner Diaz. Rachel's currently assigned to the Adams Western New York District in the South Central Region. Uh, for those you probably remember, Rachel was our officer of the year for 2020. Uh, she investigated 12 environmental incidents, which include four pollutions and eight disturbance of waterways, including one high profile investigation in York County with the offender paying over $50,000 in restitution. So with that, Rachel, if you would. Next award is called our top gun award, uh, 2020 recipient is WCO Sean Lake from Southern York County. Uh, Sean is assigned to the South Central Region in Southern York. During 2021, Officer Lake apprehended and prosecuted 20 individuals for boating under the influence. He also assisted with one other arrest. So Sean, if you would please come up, that was an outstanding job and we appreciate you keeping our waterways safe. So our next award is for the Northeast Conservation Law Enforcement Chief Association's Officer of the Year. And for 2021, that is WCO Chad Doyle. Chad serves in the South Central Crawford, Eastern Mercer County District in the Northwest region. Uh, Chad has implemented an exemplary EY and summary detection program within the assigned district. He successfully apprehended four BUI violators and assisted with three others. He investigated five environmental violations and three boat accidents, one of which was a fatal accident and another that caused damage to vessel and docks in excess of $200,000. So Chad, if you would uh, please come up. Chad was recently recognized in New Jersey at the, the Northeast Conference uh, earlier this month as well. And last, but certainly not least, we have a life saving award. That we're going to present today, and this is for WCO Justin Boatwright from the North Central region. And I'm just going to read what's on the certificate here. On February 9, 2022, Waterways Conservation Officer Justin Boatwright was attending a law enforcement meeting at Iodotton, got it right, uh, State Forest, when calls for help were heard. WCO Boatwright, DCNR staff, and Pennsylvania Game Commission State Game Warden responded to the Waterville access area. WCO Boatwright sprinted up the steep icy slope towards the victim who could not hold on. WCO Boatwright made it to the victim and alleviated the pressure on the victim's hand. While waiting for additional rescuers, the snow gave way. WCO Boatwright and the victim slid down the slope. 
WCO boat rate kept the victim secure for several hours while coordinating with rescues. So, Justin, if you would please come up. And again, to all our recipients, thank you so much for all the things you do. Uh, we as commissioners recognize you are faces out there and uh, your all things you do every day are pretty amazing sometimes and congratulations to, to all of you. All right, next we're going to, I guess I'll call to the, to the podium first, Derek Eberling. And uh, we're gonna have a presentation, the Governor's Youth Council, Derek. Thanks for coming. All right. First, would like to uh, thank the commission. Thank you, Tim, uh, for inviting us to join you today. Um, these are members of the Governor's Youth Advisory Council for Hunting, Fishing, and Conservation. My name is Derek Everly. I'm the director. Um, and this past December, we had uh, the wonderful invitation to go up and join Fish and Boat uh, staff in Erie and uh, do some steelhead uh, sampling and also visit some uh, sites uh, that uh, leverage uh, uh, Lake Erie uh, permit dollars to provide access um, uh, for, for angling opportunities up there. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll pass the mic down through and uh, each member can introduce themselves and then you guys can start your presentation if that sounds good. Hello, my name is Will Nichols. I'm from Cumberland County. Hello, everyone. My name is John Brenner and I'm from Indiana County. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Brenner. I am also from Indiana County, and I'm the current president of the council. Uh, my name is Evan Tiedman. I'm the assistant secretary of this council, and I'm from Bucks County. I'm Austin Cooper. I'm from Erie County. We were appointed by the governor through executive order 2015-2030 to uh, voice our thoughts and opinions for the next generation of hunters, fishermen, and outdoor enthusiasts to uh, all those legislators and engage more in the youth through the Commonwealth of hunting and fishing heritage. Our first day out was Monday, December 13th, 2021. On our first day, we were assigned to collecting steelhead at Trout Run. We were amazed by how many fish were charging upstream. The thing was full of thousands of different steelhead just charging up. <laughs> And there's a picture of all of them. You can see their backs and stuff running up. We got our waders and hopped in the water. And there's a picture of all of us and a few of the PFBC workers. After catching a few, we were taught how to identify and separate them by gender. And there's a picture of a few of our fish we caught. And then there's me and Elizabeth working on them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, so the Civilian Fish and Boat Commission workers uh, took our nets and assorted the steelhead. Uh, after getting the amount that they needed, uh, they were taken to the fishery, and you can see a picture there uh, of Elizabeth handing some, some steelhead to the uh, worker there. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, just some fish in the, uh, uh, the, the trailer. Okay, so since we had an open day uh, between collecting and spawning the steelhead, we decided to visit a few of Erie's uh, conservation sites. And uh, Four Mile Creek, uh, we visited there, is actually one of the first creeks in PA to have a fish ladder. And uh, basically it allows fish to move upstream uh, where they previously couldn't due to like waterfalls or rocks or things like that. Here's actually another, another, another uh, ladder that trout use. It actually, just basically go around the stream, and then water flows through. And it's just a, it's just an easier travel, like I said, uh, to get to go down or up the stream. He's actually in my backyard, and I never really understood what it was about, and I never really knew. Like I would drive by, and you know, I would see people out there, but I never really knew what actually went on here. Well, after learning about it a little bit, it's a uh, just a place for everyone to go out and fish and have a really good time. Uh, it was bought with PFBC Lake Erie permit dollars and state conservation dollars from DCNR. And now the brand property is utilized by many people to help fish and to enjoy nature and let people get out and see what it's really about. These are actually two of many of the fish that we caught that day. 
And on day three, uh, it was our final day, and we went back to uh, the Fairview Fish Hatchery. And yeah, we went and spawned the steelhead. So this, uh, this slide is going to show a video of us unloading the steelhead from the trailer into the tanks. If it please. All right, well, it's not going to play. Um, it was just us uh, uh, scooping up some of the steelhead that were in the trailer and just putting it down the slide into one of the tanks. So um, first, when we first got there, um, three after we decontaminated, um, we observed how to properly sedate the fish, and we got to watch them take them from the tank into a bucket, like a barrel, full of the sedation chemicals. And it was cool because, like, first they got in there and everything was, like, crazy all flying around. And after, like, uh, maybe a minute, it was just dead quiet. Um, and then after we picked up beast trout and uh, we went to a researcher and we gave him a little sample of each egg to make sure that there wasn't like any issues with any of the eggs or diseases. And after we got the all clear, uh, we put all the eggs into a strainer. After uh, we got like a whole strainer full of eggs, each um, worker grabbed a male trout and got the sperm from the males to fertilize those eggs. Uh, those eggs were taken to the fishery, and then they were uh, waiting to be hatched after a certain amount of time. Uh, we kept doing this process until we emptied out all the females, and they emptied out all the males. All right, so this trip to Erie was really important to us, and here on the slide are a few reasons uh, why it was really important to the council. So first, it of course expanded our knowledge on steelhead, so some of us uh, didn't have a lot of previous knowledge on steelhead and the process of spawning and how they breed. And so this really helped us expand our knowledge on that so we can talk knowledgeably to others about it. It also helped us learn about steelhead in Pennsylvania and their impact because it is one of the fish that people travel all over the place and come up to Erie to fish that. And it's really important uh, for our financial, so it brings a lot of money into the state, which is really important. Of course, that helps fund uh, more conservation impacts in the future. So it also gives us better insight on the different hatcheries in Pennsylvania and their importance. Uh, those hatcheries are really important. Um, again, it helps to get those fish out into the streams and grow them and and then we get more money from all the anglers that go out and fish them. It again, taught us how the steelhead breed. Um, some of us, you know, we have a basic knowledge of, of how fish breed, but it really helped us to bring light to the specific fish steelhead. Another important uh, aspect of this trip was it showed all the council members who attended different careers that are available for us in the fisheries business. So we're on the Governor's Youth Council for hunting, fishing, and conservation, right? So we have this interest in the outdoors, in conservation, and some of us want to pursue a career in that. And so being able to talk with all those fish and boat employees and learn about what their jobs are, what they do every day, that really helped us to learn, hey, this is a possible career path that I could go into in the future. It also helped us, uh, connected a lot of us with the employees and had a great experience. So I know Will talked uh, with Robert about his experience at Penn State, and now I think Will is actually thinking about attending Penn State. And I also was able to, to talk with some of the employees about, hey, what does a fishery biologist do every single day? Because I want to be a biologist. And so we were really able to get that uh, experience. So trips like this, uh, what, will they, what will they do in the future? Well, they will give future leaders such as us, but also uh, legislators, another, another fish and boat employees, game commission employees. So all these future leaders insight on topics which decisions can be made. And so it really taught us, you know, helped us to, to grow in uh, networking and different things like that. It also gave inspiration for positive change in the environment. And so for us, we were able to go there, learn about the steelhead, and think about what changes could be made in the future, and especially for youth. Being able to have that youth voice is super important. So like I talked about previously, it opened up new connections by networking and also showed us different career paths that we could possibly go into in the future. And so uh, before we end, we really, really wanted to say a special thank you. All of these people on this slide, uh, whether they were working directly with us or indirectly with us that day, and that actually weekend into the week, 
they really helped us uh, be able to come up there to Erie and have this trip and learn as much as we did and network as much as we did. And we really could not have done it without them. Uh, we especially want to thank Chad Foster. He really helped us out. Uh, not on this list is Dee Fisher, who is one of our advisors and liaisons with the Fish and Boat Commission. She really did a fantastic job. Uh, we also want to thank our advisor, Derek, for pulling this together. And of course, our parents who helped uh, drive all of us up there and give up their time uh, and a little bit of money to, to, to help us be able to go to these trips. And so with all that being said, we would like to thank you, uh, the Fish and Boat Commissioners, and uh, Mr. Schaefer for letting us out here today and talking with you about uh, our trip to Erie uh, with the Fish and Boat Commission. And we'd like to open it up with any questions that you may have for us. Thank you. Great job to all. And uh, we're really excited to have had you have this opportunity. And I know some of our commissioners and, of course, Bob, you, you got mentioned here too. Any comments or I think Bill, Dan, you you participate and Don? Or could the Fish and Boat Commission do for the Youth Council? Are there other things that you would like to see us try to involve you in? Does anyone have any comments on it? Uh, just any opportunities we have in the future. If you guys have any for us that you'd like us to pursue, anything would be great. We thank you for this opportunity, though. Yeah. In the past, uh, the Youth Council has actually made videos on safety with the help of uh, Dr. Schaefer. We made videos on cold water safety and boating safety, and that was really helpful because a lot of the people that we're not wearing their life vest, you know, they're younger people. And so having the youth perspective on saying, hey, this is an important thing to do, uh, that really, we think we made an impact on on uh, people in Pennsylvania. And so I think if, uh, I don't have anything specific on, on what the commission can do to help us, but we are really open to working with you guys and anything that you think would be helpful with a youth perspective on um, reaching the youth that are in Pennsylvania. I know something that you know, everyone, I guess, tries to work on these days is getting more youth involved in the outdoors uh, because the statistics, you know, a lot of youth are, are more inside. Uh, and thankfully, during COVID, we were able to, to get more people out. And so that was, was looking pretty great. Um, but, you know, something I think everyone tries to work on is getting more youth involved in the outdoors. So. She and I have been working uh, really closely together. Um, I actually have the, yeah. the list uh, Director Schaefer provided us for upcoming events for survey uh, surveying about trout streams and different other opportunities so we're reviewing that and of course it's always a challenge to work with everyone's schedules to get in here but uh he's done a really great job giving me an idea of what's been in the new day of the day of the day have any of you <coughs> helped out on a fish stocking field line Evan, can you talk about that yeah i just did it uh last week i think uh, I'm in Bucks County, so I helped stock the uh, the, 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 the Delaware Canal, and we went down through like Yardley and all there, and hit every spot, and it was pretty cool. I'll do it again. I'm planning on helping. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, John and I actually uh, helped with that a couple of years ago at a local fish nursery, and it was a really amazing experience. But but there's another opportunity. You know, I think most most of those are open to the public, right, for volunteers. So it's another opportunity for us to get out there and, and help the Fish and Boat Commission. So thank you for that. I have one too. Yeah. Good morning, and thanks for coming. You mentioned. Uh, positive change and you are the legacy that we're going to leave fishing and boating and the environment too. So I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on what positive change looks like to you, either as it relates to environment or fishing and boating? And it doesn't have to be related to your trip to Erie. Have you thought about that? What does positive change look like to you? 
I think in a general a positive change, I like to see more and more people go outdoors. Like whenever I go fishing, I would like to see a lot more people out there, like hiking or in general. Like I hope that this council will bring more kids in. And right now we're not having the most luck with the kids. So I'm hoping that in the future, more positive change would be seeing more kids apply to this council or just get more involved in fishing and hunting and anything in general. I agree with that. Yeah. Are you say anything? And then in the fishing world, I think one important change would be the cleaning of waters and the area around the waters to protect the fish and their habitats. I think that's an important thing in the future. Everyone needs to focus on. Yeah, I was thinking that same thing. Well, is you know we always talk about pollution and that's something huge right now. And one of the things actually a lot of us do the environmental and the environmental is waste management. Um, and so that's you know something that's that's really big. So. Positive change would be trying to to make a difference, and that starts with education. You know, talking to people about hey, little things you can do every day in your life are making a, a difference in the end. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anybody that participated? If not, let's give our guests a big round of applause and thanks. And we wish you the best in your your careers and your advocacy for conservation, for fishing, hunting, and, and all outdoor pursuits. We really appreciate the fact that you're taking interest in it and go out there and promote it the best you can. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you so much for having us today. Next uh, on the agenda is review approval of our January 25th, 2022 to meeting, meeting minutes. And um, Yvonne. Thank you. All right. Every everyone has received uh, the minutes from our January 25th meeting. Is there any additions or corrections to the minutes? I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, January minutes. A okay, motion's been made by Commissioner Anderson. Is there a second? I would second that. BJ. Any comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, we'll turn it over to Tim Schaefer, our executive director, for his report. Thanks, Rick. And just want to <clears throat> thank the students and Derek again. It's a, always a, a pleasure to be with them. Uh, Julie Kerrigan and I were at the Capitol with Derek and, and all the students recently uh, during the, the day on the hill that they had. And uh, anything we can do to support the Youth Council, we're happy to do. Um, so I, I'd just like to start my remarks by just thanking all the staff and volunteers who have who helped to kick off trout season this year. Um, I cannot count the number of compliments. And Brian Wisner, please pass this along to everybody um, within the hatchery system on 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 the fish that were stocked this year. I mean, the size, the color, just the the quality. Um, lots of rave reviews. You know, WCO saying they're the best they've seen in years, if not ever. Uh, similar from a lot of the, the longtime volunteers. So thanks to everybody uh, for that. And that is a testament to the dedication and diligence that all of our staff put in throughout the year to, to produce such great product. Um, we are also really happy to welcome, welcome volunteers back this year. We had to pick up the gap initially, um, but then had really great response and participation from volunteers in the field. Uh, just had some more out, I was out with some this weekend in, in Bedford County. Um, also, as we kicked off, you know, we did a lot of ice fishing this year, but really kicked things things kicked off in earnest with trout season. The license system uh, performed great. Uh, you know, throughout the whole weekend of opening day, I had my, my phone with me as I always do, but didn't get any any calls or emails from Brian or Bernie, which was a good thing. So uh, the new license system is performing um, as it's been intended to, and has uh, made some improvements. And I think I got the best endorsement from one of my kids. I, I always tell the boys, you know. If you're, when your friends get their license online, let them know how, how they uh, liked it. And I got a, a, a text on the night before opening day and said that Eric Nakovich said it was really easy to do. So if, if an 18 year old kid from Cedar Cliff can do it easy, I thought that was a good endorsement. So Bernie, thank you. Um, but again, just as a reminder, everybody listening that oh, trout season is just the, just the beginning um, and, and the opening day is just the beginning. Um, our in season stockings will continue through the end of May. Uh, go to Fishboat PA or to our website, fishingboat.com. 
Um, but that's, again, just the beginning. As the water heats up, our wild trout waters um, are a phenomenal resource. So please take advantage of that. We were talking with some of the commissioners this morning that, you know, as the water warms up and you see some of those hatches, uh, you really can't beat the thousands of miles of wild trout streams we have. Uh, panfish, catfish, all that is really heating up as the water finally warms up. Um, and don't forget uh, about the opening of walleye season, uh, first weekend of May. Uh, we do expect it to be another great year on Lake Erie, um, just record numbers of fish out there. So please get out there and enjoy the, uh, the fish cleaning stations that our staff did a great job putting in place at the end of last season. It'll be there for anglers this year. Uh, speaking of Northwest PA, I want to thank everybody who was involved with the Linesville Open House. Um, it was really nice to return to that activity. Uh, staff throughout the agency assisted with that. Uh, really appreciate the commissioners who showed up. Um, I think the final count was close to say 5,000 people, I think, for that event. Uh, just a, a dynamite day, even though it was snowing sideways half the time. So uh, thanks to those who participated there. Reminder to commissioners that our fisheries management, habitat, maintenance staff uh, are already out in the field for field season. So please, please do join us. Uh, we've extended the offer to um, the youth council, but join us for a stream or lake survey if you haven't done it before. Any time of day, any time of night we're out there. Um, it's really fun to do our habitat projects and seeing the work that we're doing on behalf of the anglers. Uh, you can't beat going out um, on a stream habitat project or a lake habitat project. And then non-game species, you know, a reminder that all we do for all fish, reptiles, and amphibians, staff are out there doing surveys from wood turtles to timber rattlesnakes throughout the year. Please consider joining us. Um, I did want to note the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, we've talked about a couple of times in this room, is getting closer and closer to, to being passed in Congress. That would bring the amount of funding that comes to the Pennsylvania split between us and the Game Commission from a little less than $2 million a year to over $20 million a year for non-game species conservation. So thank you to our federal elected officials who have been seeing that through and our partners at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. We're optimistic that's going to get passed here. Uh, this summer and just I mean, an absolute game changer for the non-game work we do. Uh, finally, reminder, remind everyone uh, that the cold water life jacket wear uh, requirement is still in place through the end of this month. All canoes and kayaks and boats under 16 feet. Um, regrettably spent uh, part of last evening in touch with Clyde who was getting uh, reports on boat accidents. Uh, fortunately, I haven't heard about any fatalities, uh, but heard about boat accidents on the water yesterday as, as things warmed up. The water is still cold. Uh, wear your life jacket all year long, but in particular, you're required to do it um, uh, through the end of April. And all, again, all canoes and kayaks and boats under 16 feet. Um, last thing I'll note, uh, National Safe Boating Week, mark your calendars for May 21st through 27th. We will be statewide that week doing uh, safe boating messages and programming um, and, and with, our, with our partners, the, um, National Association of State Boating Law Administrators, uh, DCNR, we've got some events planned at state parks. Uh, so please get ready for May 21st to 27th, National Safe Boating Week. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you, Tim. Next, I'd just like to announce that uh, this morning, prior to our, our meeting here, we, we had a, held an executive session where we talked about legal, real estate, and personnel matters. Next on our agenda, I'm going to introduce Wayne Melnick, our counsel, and Wayne. Thank you, President Kaufman. On December 25th of 2021, Executive Director Schaefer, acting under the authority of our regulations that uh, relate to temporary changes to fishing regulation, uh, took immediate action to modify temporary fishing regulations at Rac Raccoon Creek State Park, Upper Pond. Uh, this was necessary to uh, conserve and preserve fishing opportunities and appropriate for the management of fish. The details can be found at Exhibit A of our agenda or in the December 25th, 2021 issue of the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Okay, we're gonna move through committee reports and then after the law enforcement committee report, we'll, we'll take a break, okay? So next up, we have a report from the Boating Committee. Commissioner Charlesworth, with your report, please. Uh, the Boating Committee was represented at the Boating Advisory Board meeting 
on February 7, uh, 2022. Uh, the following is a brief overview of the topics discussed at that meeting. Staff presented a number of informational presentations rate relating to the commission's recreational boat boating safety program, including an overview of the annual performance report to the U.S. Coast Guard, a summary of boating safety education efforts, an update on water rescue program, uh, a report on boat registrations and launch permits, uh, transactions, and a boating incident analysis. Staff proposed regulatory amendments that clarify fire extinguisher, extinguisher requirements, increase the horsepower limitation on Woodcock Creek Lake in Crawford County, and clarify boat towed water sport, water sport requirements through Title 58. The Boating Advisory Board recommended these regulated regulatory amendments be advanced to the commission and they are included in today's commission meeting agenda. In other business discussed, staff presented a request they received for an annual expansion of legal hours of operation for personnel or for per personal watercraft. Um, after discussing this request, the Boating Advisory Board recommended that no changes be made to current legal hours of operations uh, found in 58, section 58 of the PA code, section 109.3. Additional discussion items included a legislative update and a variety of programmatic uh, overviews. Staff announced that a, a variety of activities and events are being planned for National Safe Boating Week, which is May 21 through May 27, and additional information will be provided. Uh, draft Boating Advisory Board meeting minutes have been posted to the Commonwealth's website. And Mr. President, that concludes my report. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, moving on to the next committee, Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee, Commissioner Pastore. Thank you, President Kaufman. The Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee convened once since the January 2022 commission meeting. That meeting was held on March 28, 2022 at the Commission's Center Region Office in Belfont. There were four discussion items on the agenda for the committee meeting. First was the Chapter 71 Rewrite Fish Health Protocols and stocking authorization overview. Second was a false trout stocking program overview. Third, an overview of the fisheries agenda items planned for this meeting. And finally, the commissioner discussion regarding wild trout populations. These items were discussion oriented and no votes were taken. That concludes my report on the fisheries and hatcheries committee. Okay, thank you, commissioner. Next, we have our law enforcement committee report, Commissioner Gibney. Thank you, President Kaufman. The law enforcement committee met at, uh, on April 8th, 2022 at the Tom Ridge Center at uh, Presque Isle State Park. Um, the, all the committee members, with the exception of Commissioner Lewis was present, as well as Commissioner Pastore and, and yourself. Uh, we had an executive session at the beginning to discuss potential lit litigation issues, and then, excuse me, had a um, heard about um, a revocation request for an individual in possession of smallmouth bass in closed season and over the limit of smallmouth bass, in which we took a vote to agree to a three-year revocation for that individual. Then we had a lengthy discussion about proposed rulemakings to sections uh, 63.5 regarding uh, taking and attempting to take fish 
uh, 63.9 regarding the use of trout beads for fishing. And finally, uh, section 63.105A uh, regarding uh, using cleaning stations and how fillet fish fillets must be handled. Um, those regulations will be presented, those changes to the regulations will be presented today by Colonel Warner. And that concludes my, dis my presentation. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Okay, before we uh, uh, proceed with the rest of the agenda and some new business, let's take a 10 minute break. Let's try to all be back here uh, about quarter of 11 and we'll begin the second half of our morning. Brian, this is on ready to go. So this thing works. Um, okay, if, if we could reconvene and keep our meeting moving, appreciate it. Found out is if you too close this, I can hold the thing. All right, and next on our agenda, you speaking from here. Which do you know? Can you hear us? We have. Proposed rulemaking items. We're going to begin with fisheries and Chris. Don't sit down. I think going to going to start with Chris Kuhn um, to talk about some proposed rulemaking making under fisheries. Commissioner, actually, we're going to start with Brian Wisner. If that's okay. Okay. If it's okay with Brian Brian Wisner, we'll we'll start with him. It's okay with me. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. I'm Brian Wisner, and I'm the director for the Bureau of Hatcheries. And this morning we're going to be talking about a proposed rulemaking um, amendments to chapter 71 and 73. Uh, this is going to be a tag team effort and I'm going to start it off by giving you some background information about the rewrite of chapter 71 and 73 regulations. Um, it's going to involve things with uh, aquatic invasive species, fish health certification and the stocking authorization component. So 71 and 73 revolve around the introduction of fish into the Commonwealth waters and transportation of live fish into the Commonwealth. It's also part of our strategic plan goals that we uh, collaborate and identify and collaborate with agriculture and the aquaculture communities to protect sport fisheries and prevent negative impacts from fish stockings, such as spreads of pathogens and aquatic invasive species. Uh, we're gonna look at revising these regulations um, for the uh, introduction of fish, revising the regulations relating to transportation of live fish, and the implementation of the stocking authorization program. Now, right now, there, there's no specific requirements for fish health testing for imports or stocking except viral hemorrhagic septicemia, or VHS. There's a need for specific regulations for importing fish and stocking fish in PA waters. And most states around us have requirements for determining how and when fish are stocked into various waters. Now, currently, fish may be stocked as long as they meet the propagation and introduction list. For those of you that maybe aren't familiar with this, we have a list that's called our propagation introduction, which has the different watersheds in Pennsylvania and a list of species that may either be raised or stocked into those watersheds. And that's what we go by for the uh, commercial propagators and people moving fish around. We do require gill lice testing for rainbow trout and brook trout, and that's required for special activity permits. So if someone is having a derby or a tournament, they need an SAP, a special activity permit, they would have to have gill lice testing for those trout. We also require fish health testing for our own state fish hatcheries and the fish that we import. So our fish health unit goes out to all of our various state fish hatcheries, does a complete diagnostic test on the fish that are out at those hatcheries so that we can make sure that we have good, clean, healthy fish that we're stocking out there for anglers. Also, when we're importing fish from other states for our programs, such as uh, we sometimes we get striped bass fingerlings from other states, we don't raise those here, we get those from our, our friends in other states, we make sure that they have a fish health cert certification before we import them and stock them. So as some examples of why we need these kind of regulations and why they need to be improved, uh, right now we have the gill lice testing for SAPs. 
but trout with gill lice could still be stocked if they're not covered by an SAP. So if someone wants to go out and stock behind their camp or in, in a private property, they don't need a stocking, or they don't need a special activities permit. So they could just buy the trout and have them stocked and they don't need gill lice testing. That's one of the reasons. Um, fish could also be stocked, for example, a uh, largemouth bass with undetected largemouth bass virus could be stocked in the newly renovated lakes. We've done a lot of work on dams out there, refilling them. We follow a specific plan of stocking forage fish, pan fish, predator fish, and we want them all to be clean, healthy fish that are moved into those new lakes. Right now, someone could bring in largemouth bass virus into that lake without us knowing it. And as an example, recently we were getting ready to stock one of those lakes with our own largemouth bass. And when we tested the brood source, there was largemouth bass virus in those brood. So we did not stock those fish into that newly renovated lake. And we're able to catch that. We wanna make sure we catch it for everybody. Another example would be muscalunge could be stocked into a lake managed for largemouth bass. If our fisheries biologists are managing a lake specifically for largemouth bass, they may not want another species like muscalunge to be stocked and become the apex predator in that lake that they're managing for largemouth. We want the muskies to be stocked in the musky lakes. And one that's a concern uh, to a lot of us is uh, West Coast trout viruses. There are viruses out in the West Coast in California, Oregon, Washington that we don't have here in Pennsylvania. And someone could purchase fish or eggs from a source out on the West Coast, bring them into Pennsylvania and wind up stocking those fish and inadvertently stock one of those fish with a virus from the West Coast that we don't have. We wanna prevent that very much. So what we did was uh, assemble a team of folks from Fish and Boat Commission from different bureaus with different levels of expertise and different topics. And we worked with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and uh, they helped us out with the new language. They reviewed things for us. Uh, PDA, the, the Department of Agriculture has regulatory authority over the private fish farms. We wanted to make sure they were involved in that aspect of it. They also only regulate dangerous, dangerous and transmissible diseases. So we had quite a few conversations about how that related to our regulations. We also wanted to work with the commercial fish farms. So we provided draft regulations early on to the Pennsylvania Aquaculture Advisory Committee for their review and comments. And right now, our fish farmers out there, they don't just sell fish for eating, they sell a lot of fish for stocking into the PA waters. Um, so we work to minimize the impact on the fish farmers after discussions with them, we learned about what they needed. Um, we're gonna require imported fish health testing for pathogens that are not found in PA. That was a big thing for them. There are viruses and pathogens that aren't in Pennsylvania. We don't wanna bring those in here. There are some that are already here, they're endemic and that's not really gonna require any additional testing. And most of the intrastate stocking would not require fish health testing, except for the gill lice that I mentioned, but there are some exceptions. So some of the issues that the fish farmers wanted to bring up and we talked about, were not increasing their cost of production. That's a big one for them, their business, and they wanna keep that cost down. They wanted the process to be easy and fast, hopefully with an electronic application and a quick response. We'd all like to have that. I think that's the best thing for us moving forward, but we are gonna start with a paper submission at first, and this will allow us to gather good information and determine the volume of actual stockings that are taking place across the Commonwealth. We're gonna also allow that to help us fine tune the application process so that by the time we get to the electronic version, we'll have all the bugs worked out. And we'll be able to, to move forward much more efficiently. Uh, one thing they wanted was to provide a grace period to adjust their production. Since we're gonna have a fish health component, they may have to do some adjustments in the, where they get their fish, how they test their fish, clean up their hatcheries a little bit. So we're gonna give a couple of years of a grace period. And they wanted us to minimize, we wanna minimize the impact on the aquaculture industry. That's one of our goals. Also, this stocking authorization will include all stockings in Pennsylvania, including our cooperative nurseries, private hatcheries, and other agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Everyone will go through this process. So these updated regulations, they're gonna help us with, help keep new pathogens out of PA waters, protect the aquatic resources, fish farms, and angling opportunities. 
So this was just some background information to help lead into the other speakers. We're going to continue this discussion. Bob Cassis, our assistant counsel, will talk about the changes in Chapter 71 and 73 regulations. Koji Yamashita, our fish health unit leader, will talk about the fish health certification process. Dave Nyhart, chief of the Division of Fish Management, Fisheries Management, will talk about the stocking authorization process. And I do ask that you please hold your questions until all the speakers have presented. I think a lot of your questions are going to be answered as we move from one person to the next. And then we'll all be up here to answer your questions uh, at the conclusion. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Bob. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bob Cassis. I'm assistant counsel with the Fish and Boat Commission. And what I'm going to be doing today is talking a little bit about chapter 71 and 73, uh, more from a broad overview and what changes are occurring within both of those chapters. So both chapters were first promulgated in the mid 1980s and both of those chapters have a variety of topics within again, most uh, cover the introduction of fish into the Commonwealth as well as the transportation of live fish into the Commonwealth, but there's other things such as the propagation list regulations, uh, wilderness waters, the stocking of, des uh, of commissioned fish, etc. But we also have provisions that address prohibited species and uh, to an extent fish health. Now, since the mid 1980s, amendments to both sections have occurred. Uh, most recently in 2018. Can everybody hear me better here? Perfect, thank you. So as I was mentioning, in both chapters, there have been amendments that have occurred since the mid-1980s, most recently in 2018, and that covered really the triploid grass carp section as well as a small change to the propagation list section. But right now, a comprehensive rewrite of both is needed to address the current conservation challenges and aquatic resources needs going into the future. And what I will mention is in addition to this proposed rulemaking, the commission is also looking at a broader effort to address dangerous exotic species, and that'll eventually be coming into the picture down the road, but it is something that we are working on. So why the need for the rewrite? Well, there, there's a number of reasons. Obviously, it's, we want our regulations to be consistent with neighboring states. You know, we want healthy fisheries. We want to prevent the spread of pathogens and diseases, as well as aquatic invasive species. Within our state, we don't have any specific watercraft inspection requirements. So that's something that we wanted to add in again to address the aquatic invasive species component. We want to improve the accuracy of where fish are stocked in uh, Commonwealth waters. And more importantly, we really wanted to, it's down on the bottom here, but improve the regulation as a whole in terms of consistency, flow, and ease. There was a lot of repetitive language between both chapters. So what we've done is tried to clean that up for the benefit of obviously the public and those within the agency. So currently up on the screen, what we have are the existing sections within both chapter 71 and 73. And in chapter 73.2, you see it's uh, listed as reserved. That just means that that particular section doesn't exist anymore. It was essentially removed or deleted years ago. So whenever the, the commission does something like that, that'll always show up as reserved. So again, uh, between both chapters, there are some similar provisions, but for the most part, that's what both address. Next slide here, you see some of the provisions or actually most of the provisions are highlighted in yellow. And those are provisions that we're keeping either entire text or partial text from. There's a lot of good things in all of these sections here. And what we really wanted to do was build upon both chapters and improve it with today's conservation needs and issues. So again, Everything you see there in yellow is being retained partially or fully because they're working well right now and uh, we want to keep that going. So within the new uh, chapter that I'll be introducing here in a second, what we're including is new sections that address the stocking authorization, 
fish health, as I mentioned previously, watercraft inspection, uh, and some additions to the prohibited species list, and then uh, a section that addresses bait fish use here in the, in the Commonwealth. And what they'll all do is they'll be combined into a single chapter 71A. I say 71A because due to Pennsylvania bulletin and code guidelines, uh, if we're removing the text from 71 and essentially putting new text in in its entirety, we have to add an A after that. So the new chapter itself will be called Chapter 71A. Right now, uh, throughout the U.S., over 30 states have requirements or regulations that dictates how and when fish are stocked in state waters. And in fact, all states in the Northeast do have something in place of this nature except Pennsylvania. Another why as to why we're doing this is obviously fish health and listed on the screen are a couple, well actually a few uh, vectors or diseases that have spread to fish already here in the Commonwealth. Brian Wisner had mentioned gill lice, but also included our largemouth bass virus as well as whirling disease. One benefit of creating watercraft inspection is again to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species as uh, folks take boats to different areas or water bodies of the Commonwealth. And right now throughout the US, at least 19 states have something in place as far as watercraft inspection requirements, including New York State just north here. And throughout this process, as Brian had mentioned, we did meet with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. They're an important partner in this, as well as the Aquaculture Advisory Committee, which is comprised of uh, folks from the commercial industry, uh, really to provide transparency, but to devise regulations that work for all. We want to make sure that the aquaculture industry here in the state is, is great for everybody, not just for the, the commission and benefits all. So that's a win-win for, for everybody in stocking and propagating fish. So up on the screen, what you see is the new chapter 71A. And what we've done is we've tried to separate the chapter itself into various subchapters with related topics so that they build upon one another. Uh, whether it's, you know, propagating fish first, then fish introduction, and lastly, prohibited species, uh, aquatic invasive species, and the like. So again, there's a lot of the same provisions that were existing in both chapters but there's also some new sections that I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail with, and then staff members will go into finer detail with some of the sections. So the first one up is a stocking authorization from the commission. And essentially what it is is no species of fish shall be placed, introduced, or stocked, again, except baited on a hook, into waters of the Commonwealth without an approved stocking authorization from the commission. Importantly, waters of the Commonwealth, in this case, for the purposes of this regulation, does not include waters contained within a property or premise of a propagation facility that's licensed by the Pennsylvania De uh, Department of Agriculture. As Brian had mentioned, the Department of Agriculture has jurisdiction over those farms, so a raceway of one of those farms wouldn't be included in this case for getting a stocking authorization from the commission. Again, to help out our partners in the uh, commercial industry, what we'd like to do is for the first two years, anybody that's interested in stocking a fish in the water, uh, waters of the Commonwealth would fill out and submit a notice of stocking to the commission. Again, this is to give us an idea of how many stockings are occurring without the state and to get a better handle on uh, the stocking program, how best to, to meet it for the public's needs. Beginning on January 1st of 2025, the stocking authorization itself will be fully effective. The next new section is going to be addressing fish health. And fish health certificate may be required for fish being imported or stocked in Commonwealth waters. Again, I use the word may. Again, certain cases uh, will dictate that, as Brian had mentioned, depending on whether it's a Western US vector or disease. But for the most part here in the state, what we're trying to do is ensure that fish that are being stocked in Commonwealth waters are free from specific pathogens, diseases, and vectors. We will continue to consult with the Department of Agriculture in this case, when it comes to dangerous transmissible diseases to make sure both agencies are on the same page. 
what uh, staff have done, it's included in your materials, is a fish health protocol. This will outline the, the fish health testing process that may or may not be applicable for stockings. And similar to the stocking authorization section, what we're going to do is essentially have uh, the fish health requirements be effective on January 1st, 2025, allowing some time to adjust to the new regulations. However, existing regulations that are in place that pertain to VHS, or if you're going to apply for a special activities permit for trout, you may need to have those fish tested for gill lice. Those will stay in place uh, effective on January 1 of 2023. Next uh, new section that will be included within Chapter 71A will be watercraft inspection requirements. Again, no person shall place or attempt to place a watercraft that may have vegetation or the like on it into a water body of the Commonwealth. And, and really, you know, one prime example that we're trying to avoid spreading is hydrilla. It's, it's obviously an aquatic invasive species uh, plant. So again, this is aimed at trying to prevent that from occurring further. WCOs may order the removal of a watercraft from a water body, or at least to remove any sort of AIS that's on them or to contaminate for that matter. And again, before transporting any watercraft away from a water body, uh, villages and live wells must be drained. Again, with narrow exception, for instance, if there's a, a bass fishing tournament, in that case, those individuals will be allowed to keep the fish in there to go to a weigh in for that matter. And I know a question had come up, well, what are we doing right now with you know, aquatic invasive species with watercraft inspection or decontamination? And there's a lot of education that the agency is doing with the public through social media. Uh, we post a lot of different boat launches with decontamination posters or again, to stop aquatic hitchhiking. Uh, and as well as applying for grants, I know our staff are right now involved with applying to put aquatic invasive species cleaning stations at inland fisheries facilities, but I know it's active up in the Erie area as well. So we're being proactive about this and want to try and get a regulation in the books as well to, to further enhance and, and prevent the spread of AIS through watercraft throughout the Commonwealth. The last things that I'll talk about before I hand it off to Koja are other uh, two, two other topics that we included in the updated chapter. One concerns the prohibited species list. And New Zealand mud snail uh, is, is again a, an emerging aquatic invasive species throughout here in the state. I know a news release just went out too not, uh, not too long ago that had some tips on decontamination and how to prevent the spread. So that species has been added or will be added, and then any plant that's designated by the Department of Agriculture's Controlled Plant and Noxious Weed Committee is included on that list as well. Again, trying to work with our partners on that. Lastly, what I'll talk about is a prohibition on releasing or disposing live bait fish into waters of the Commonwealth. Again, from a aquatic resources standpoint, we don't want to spread you know, invasive species or disease or vectors that may exist out there. So in this case, we're just what we don't want is folks purchasing live bait fish and then just disposing them into a waterway at that point. Folks can still collect live bait fish as they've done and use them in the same watershed, but we, we don't want purchased live bait fish being disposed into waterways. That's all I have. I'm going to hand it off to Koja now, and he's going to go into a lot more detail on the fish health aspects of this rewrite. Commissioner Goffman, we're going to put the mic back up here and try to get rid of that static. So if you can't hear, just let Koja know, and then they can regroup and try something else. So Koja will try this. Yeah, Mike might be able to this in your way. Not so good. How's that? Okay. All right. Um, hello, my name is Koji Yamashita. Um, as Brian and Bob both mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the uh, fish health inspection protocol. It's a document that's been developed 
Um, and uh, I'm going to go over general overview of the document, the, the guiding um, goal or the goals that we are trying to achieve with the document. And then um, also talk about the proposed importation fish health requirement for, um, for requirements for fish health importation for importation of fish, the proposed requirements for the introduction or stocking of fish, and then go briefly into the actual requirements for the certification of the fish. So as far as the overall goals, um, as previously mentioned, um, we want to provide protection to the Commonwealth's aquatic resource. We want to prevent the introduction of specific pathogens, control the spread and prevalence of pathogens already present in the Commonwealth. The protocol is going to be kept separate from the actual regulation itself. Um, so you can't think of it as kind of a living document. And because of this way, we'll be able to make changes quickly when needed. Um, if you think about things like gill lice, that yeah, first came on our radar in 2016. It's 2022, we still don't have an actual regulation in place for that. Having a document like this in place will speed that process up. And then when we do make changes to the fish health inspection protocol, we'll first consult with AG, let them know what we're doing so they can reach out to the private industry and also any changes will be posted in the Pennsylvania Bulletin for public comment. And similarly, uh, we consulted with the industry throughout the development of this document. As far as the overall structure of the document, uh, it starts with fish health testing requirements for the importation of fish into the Commonwealth, the fish health testing requirements for the introduction or stocking of fish into the waters of the Commonwealth, and lastly, uh, it's the instructions on acceptable testing methodology and protocols for the certification of hatcheries. So when it comes to the importation, fish health requirements, um, as previously mentioned, the goal is to prevent the introduction of pathogens that can significantly harm the Commonwealth's aquatic resources and aquaculture industry. As Brian mentioned, there's a lot of pathogens that are not currently found in Pennsylvania. Uh, the majority of these are out in the Western United States. We want to try to keep those there. And then we also want to prevent the increase in the prevalence of specific pathogens that are already present in Pennsylvania. Um, this would be something like gill lice. They're here. We know they're here. We're trying to control them, but we don't want to bring any more in. Testing requirements are going to be determined by the combination of the shipping facilities location, which is basically the state. So we're the state where the fit where the fish are coming from in the species. There's a lot of pathogens that are species specific. And throughout the process, we want to retain the current viral hemorrhagic septicemia regulations. Um, those were developed in collaboration with the Department of Agriculture. And so we didn't want to have them change their regulations at this time either. And under this, this uh, proposed uh, system, some importations will not require fish health testing based on the species and shipping location. And so here's a table that goes over a few scenarios. Um, and hopefully provide some examples of what we're talking about here. Um, the columns, Table where we have the species, um, <clears throat> next column is fish or eggs. So whether they're importing fish or whether they're going to be importing eggs, the source, which will be the state. And then the last column contains the testing that's going to be required. And there's a lot of acronyms here, but um, really it's, it's wanted to do this to demonstrate the number of pathogens that they need to test for. So if the first row, looking at bluegills from North Carolina, um, North Carolina and Pennsylvania same, share similar pathogen profiles in that a lot of the same pathogens that are here are also down there. And there's nothing really specific to bluegills. So if you're going to be importing bluegills from North Carolina, there would be nothing that we'd be concerned about and there'd be no testing required. If you're going to be importing fathead minnows from Arkansas, there'd be only one pathogen that we're worried about there. And most of the industry in Arkansas, southern U.S. already tests for it. The next two columns deal with brown trout. and the first row looks at importing brown trout from Maine. There's a virus in Maine, uh, in, and uh, specific, so far it's only been found in Maine in the United States, in part of Canada. So if you're gonna be importing brown trout from Maine, we'd want them to test for that virus. However, if you look at the next row, we're importing brown trout from West Virginia. That virus is not in West Virginia, so we don't want that, we, there's not gonna be any testing required for that. Next three rows deal with rainbow trout. Um, 
first row also deals with West Virginia. If you recall, for brown trout, there was no testing required. However, if you're going to be importing rainbow trout from West Virginia, we want you to test for gill lice. Um, gill lice are specific to rainbow trout and brook trout. If you're going to be importing rainbow trout from California, as we've mentioned several times, there's a lot of pathogens in the Western United States that aren't here. So there's a longer list of pathogens that we'd be requiring them to test for, including gill lice. However, if you were just going to import rainbow trout eggs, there, it's a lot less in as far as the number of pathogens that we want you to test for. And you know, if you think about this, gill lice are transferred on fish, they're not transferred on eggs. A lot of these other pathogens are the same way. So that's why there'd be less if you're importing uh, eggs instead of fish. So this was all done to try to ease burden on the, uh, the commercial industry, um, really avoid unneeded testing. Um, there's been some previous regulations that are kind of an all or nothing where you have to test everything. Regardless, this is taking more of a, a approach where we're really zeroing in on what actually needs to be tested for. As far as the uh, enforcement of the importation of fish health regulations, uh, some states have uh, an importation permit where you have to file for a permit to be able to import fish into the state. We're not going that route. Instead, the enforcement will mimic the current um, BHS regulations. And it'll be the responsibility of the entity shipping the fish to be familiar with these regulations. And the shipping entity or the truck coming in will have to have the proper documentation and if they're stopped by a WCO, they'll have to be able to produce that, that uh, documentation. But on to uh, introduction or stocking fish health requirements. As uh, previously mentioned, this applies to all stockings. Um, fish and Boat Commission, Cooperative Nurseries, Federal, uh, Academic, Commercial, any fish that will be placed into the, into the waters of the Commonwealth are going to need to have this or go through this process. It only applies to the species allowed for introduction into the Commonwealth waters. As Brian Wisner mentioned, we have our introduction and propagation list. Um, for example, you, you can raise tilapia, but you can't stock them. So this doesn't address tilapia because they can't be, they're already covered under the introduction and propagation list. They can't be stocked into the waters of the Commonwealth. So we didn't include uh, diseases that affect um, tilapia. It's designed to provide protection on a variety of levels from a specific water body or to an entire state. And similar to the introduction, it's dependent on the species being stocked. And instead of where they're coming from, in this case, we're looking at where they're going. And many stocking events will have no or minimal fish health requirements. And a big point here is that it does not require that all state hatchery or all commercial hatcheries have to go through the inspection process and become certified only when it meets a certain criteria as far as the stocking event itself. So an example of a statewide requirement that we want to put in place would be gill lice certification requirements. As uh, Brian Wisner mentioned, currently it's in place for special activities permit. This would make it a uh, requirement statewide. It would only apply to brook trout, rainbow trout, and tiger trout. Uh, similar to what we talked about with the West Virginia example and brown trout, it's, um, they're not susceptible to gill lice. And basically it mimics what we, what's in place with SAP permit. Fish must be obtained from a facility or lot or shipment that has been certified gill ice free following Fish and Boat Commission's gill ice certification protocol, which we already have in place and online. This currently applies to all mission stockings, proper nursery stockings, and any stocking requiring a Fish and Boat Commission special activities permit. So this is already out there. We already follow this as an agency, whether it's in with the proper nurseries or other state hatcheries, this would just be ensuring that everybody else does the same thing. The next um, would be an example of a fish health requirement for a specific drainage or watershed. Um, so the one in the document deals with the Great Lakes watershed. It applies to stocking of fish into the Lake Erie, Ontario, and, um, Lake Ontario watershed. This includes portions of Lake um, of Erie, Crawford and Potter counties. And what it states is fish must be obtained from a facility or being a lot of fish that have been tested negative for the following pathogens. And there's a list of them. I think there's nine of them there. However, depending on what species of fish is being stocked, um, doesn't mean you have to test for all nine of those. For example, 
koi herpes virus, Spiraemia carp, only affect carp and koi. So if you're stocking trout, we're not going to require you to, to test for those. Or if you're stocking largemouth bass, you're not going to have to test for those in the Lake Erie Basin. And the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission is a member of the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. I'm sure most of you know the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. It helps set creel limits for the, the uh, Great Lakes Basin, things like that. They also um, provide recommendations on stocking when it comes to fish health requirements. And so by having this in this document, it ensures that Pennsylvania is following those recommendations. And similar to the gill ice um, recommendation or requirements for the entire state, this is something that the Fish and Boat Commission already has as an internal policy that we follow, both with the cooperative nurseries and our state hatcheries. So this would just be applying it to everybody else. The next is a um, requirement for individual waters. And the way it's worded is that waters of the Commonwealth that have species reintroduction and or restoration efforts in place. And that the Fish and Boat Commission may require specific fish health testing for these waters. And when this occurs, the Fish and Boat Commission will notify the stocking authorization applicant during the authorization review process. And an example of where we might want to do this is with some of the lakes that are being refilled. And as Brian Wisner mentioned earlier, these, uh, you know, we're making sure that the fish that we put in these lakes are clean. So we want to make sure everybody else is doing the same thing. When it comes to the enforcement of the fish health requirements for stocking, the stocking authorization will clearly state when a fish health cert certificate is needed. If required, the stocking authorization applicant is responsible for obtaining and ensuring that the fish health certificates are present at the stocking and are presented to the Fish and Boat Commission when requested. So it's not the responsibility of the farm or the, where they're obtaining the fish to have these. The applicant just needs to make sure they go to a farm and purchase fish that have been certified. So the aquaculture facilities are not being required to go through a certification process that would fall to the Department of Ag to make some kind of requirement like that. Depending on the stocking location and species, some stocking events will not have any fish health requirements. That's the last part of that. As far as the fish health inspection and report protocols, the fish health inspection will be valid for 365 days from the date of issuance. The number of fish to be sampled and the accepted testing protocols are the same in many surrounding states, such as New York, Maryland, New Jersey. This is important for the commercial industry. So if they get um, an inspection for any one of those states, it will also work in Pennsylvania or vice versa. And they can get inspected here, sell to the other states. If a facility tests positive for a specific pathogen, the protocol outlines ways for a facility to demonstrate freedom from that pathogen. And it allows for a variety of reports and certifications that are standard for the industry. We're not creating a special report that the labs have to fill out specific for Pennsylvania. We'll accept ones that go to New York or Maryland, New Jersey. So in summary, the Fish Health Inspection Protocol provides a vital tool to aid the Fish and Boat Commission in its mission. It provides protection to the Commonwealth's aquatic industry, well, aquaculture industry. Uh, they don't want diseases getting into their hatcheries as well. A lot of the, the uh, private industry pulls water out of streams. And if a, a disease gets in that stream, they're probably going to get into their hatchery as well, leads to mortality, loss of profits. So it's in their best interest to, to do this as well. And there may be a financial impact to the aquaculture industry. However, we took many steps to reduce this impact. And once again, fish health testing will not be required for all stockings or imports. And then lastly, the uh, protocol is separate from the reg regulation, so it can be modified as needed. So, that's the end of my part, and uh, now Dave Iron's going to give his presentation. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, Dave Nyer, Chief of the Division of Fisheries Management. Um, so, I'm going to cover a lot of what's in this presentation has been touched on during the first uh, three presentations you saw. But hopefully this will go into greater detail and answer any questions that you may have. So as far as the stocking authorization, really what is the need uh, is to ensure that all stockings uh, of fish proposed in these waters are reviewed, uh, considered for their ecological risk and approved where appropriate. 
And it's often we get asked, you know, we're tasked as an agency to manage the resource and manage the fisheries. And it becomes very difficult to manage something if you're sure, if you're not sure what species is being stocked and at what number. So really this will give us a better understanding of what's being stocked uh, and allow us to set up to, to manage our resources. So who is required uh, for a stocking authorization? Really anybody, as mentioned before, uh, any a member of the general public is gonna be required for an authorization. This does apply to um, our commission cooperative nurseries, sportsman's group, and as Brian mentioned before, other agencies that wish to stock will have to get an authorization. A couple of general things. This will be free uh, to anybody who's using it. There's no fee associated with applying for or receiving an authorization. The process will be simple and user friendly. And as mentioned before, when we were discussing this with industry, the, one of the things that they kept on bringing up is this process has to be simple. It has to be able to be filled out in a timely manner and be reviewed. And one way of doing that is, is hopefully following the formats that we propose. So ideally, this will be very simple for everybody to use. Implementation of the process will occur in two phases. So what are those phases? This is, this is the first one we're calling uh, the first uh, an interim process being noticed or being called a notice of stocking. It's going to be proposed for the first two years of the program. So beginning of January 1st of 2023 through the end of 2024, a notice of stocking will be implemented. Under this phase, applications will be uh, submitted. They'll be required to be submitted, but they will not be reviewed by staff. So even though they're not going to be reviewed internally, anybody wishing to stock fish still has to um, fill out a notice of stocking. There are some benefits from going with this process. Again, this is just the first of, of two phases. Um, so knowing that we're going this route, you know, we are expecting some additional benefits to come from this that's going to set us up in a better place moving forward with the stocking authorization. We'll provide applicants with a grace period to learn and better understand the authorization process, very similar to what was Kojim referenced uh, previously with the fish health requirements. This will provide a grace period for folks to understand the process uh, moving forward. It'll allow the commission to adjust stocking authorization process to comply with the final regulations that will be passed by the board, um, as Bob mentioned. We'll also give st staff time to explore options for accepting applications electronically. This initial phase, uh, this initial notice of stocking will take place by uh, mail, fax, or delivered. So applications will be delivered um, in person by the mail. There will be no electronic sub submission at this point. Current Commonwealth IT related security co concerns and protocols limit and prevent electronic submission uh, at this point, but options are being explored um, as, as currently. IT management system is being designed to accommodate a, both the manual application process and an electronic uh, submission process. So internally, the database and the housing for these authorizations or applications um, is being designed to accept both the manual and anticipation of electronic submission in the near future. This also provides us an opportunity for the commission to properly assess the number and types of applications um, submitted. And really, this is going to allow us to determine how many staff are going to be dedicated to this process. And that's one question that we get is, well, how many people is this going to take um, for this process? We really don't know because we don't have a good understanding of, of how many uh, stockings are going out there. So this will allow us to get that information to set us up to make sure that when it does go live with the authorization process, we have the adequate number of staff um, for this. So. It allow us um, to gather additional data that can ultimately be used to develop a user-friendly process. So the next phase is we're anticipating having electronic submission format. A manual, manual uh, submission will still be allowed, but the idea is to have something electronically in place. So going this first route with the notice of stocking uh, will set us up to, to fine-tune electronic submission moving forward. So the next phase, um, so the first phase was notice of stocking. The second phase will be an online process that we're calling a stocking authorization. So beginning on January 1st of 2025, the stocking authorization shall be fully effective. Applications will be reviewed or will be submitted electronically. And unlike the notice of stocking, um, these applications will be reviewed by staff. 
So by doing an online system, uh, online submission system, it'll allow for a timely review of all applications in order to minimize the burden of experience by both the user and the producer. So again, during our meeting, setting this up with industry, not only did they want something simple and user friendly, they also wanted something that wasn't gonna hurt their business. So by going to this, this online system, it'll allow for, for a quick and easy review of all authorizations having very minimal impact on not only the individuals purchasing the fish, but also the producers that are supplying them. All applications will be reviewed, and if the applicant will receive a stocking authorization, an authorization will either be approved, um, denied, or approved with amendments. So as far as the application itself, it'll be a single page, again, at the request of, of, of many, keeping it friendly or keeping it user friendly, a single page is one way to do that. There's gonna be three major fields that are gonna be included on the authorization application. Uh, applicant information, stocking location, and fish species information. So now we'll talk in a little bit of detail about the three fields. So the first one, applicant information, some very basic information on who's applying for them, uh, who's applying for the authorization, are they affiliated with any group or sponsor, uh, phone number, mailing address, and email address. So again, just basic information, if we have to contact the individual submitting the applicant, we have, a, have the avenue to do that. The next field, stocking location information. Very basic stuff as well, the body of water, is it, is it a lake, is it a pond, is it a stream, is it a river? Uh, the specific area where the stocking will be occurring, the length, the size, GPS coordinates, anything that's gonna allow staff during the review process to really key in on where the actual stocking is going to be occurring. Uh, again, a county, municipality, uh, just two other, other ways that we can narrow in where the stocking's occurring. And the last thing that's gonna be part of this is a stocking date, and it's gonna be a date range associated with it. Um, so if somebody wants to stock fish on April 15th and for whatever reason, there's high flows or the truck breaks down, they're not held to that stocking date. So there's gonna be a buffer uh, associated with the, with the stocking date, more of a range than a specific date. The last part uh, is the fish species information. We wanna know the species of fish, the number and or weight of fish being stocked, the life stage, so are they stocking fingerlings, are they stocking adults, brood fish, and then last is the source of the fish. So the review process, applications will be reviewed and either approved or considered for a revision based off of many things, including the species of fish, number of fish, the location, or if there's any fish health concerns. Um, these will be the things that will be reviewed and ultimately determine whether or not an authorization is approved, denied, or approved with amendments. A decision matrix will be, will be um, developed and will be uniformly applied during the review process. And this really allows for an unbiased review regardless of where the fish are being coming from where, where they're gonna be stocked and the numbers. So prior to an application being denied, staff will contact the applicant to address any concerns they have. The last thing we wanna do is to flat out tell somebody no, they can't do something. But there is gonna be cases where if somebody requests a certain species or a certain location that the stocking may be prohibited. But by reaching out to the applicant and addressing that, we may be able to revise the permit, obvious, or the application and um, provide provide an approved application. So the last thing we wanna do is flat out deny something. So we wanna work with, with the users to make sure that stocking can occur. Um, a detailed explanation will be provided uh, with, with our concerns of an application uh, cannot be resolved and ultimately has to be denied. An applicant agreed by staff decision uh, to deny their application can, may appeal to the commission in the manner provided under 1 PA code 3520. So the recommendation, staff recommend that the commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing amendments described in the commentary. If adopted on final rulemaking, these amendments will go into effect on January 1st of 2023. Okay, thanks everybody for the presentation. Um, good time for questions. If we have some prior to uh, working on the recommendation for staff, any specific questions that you might have in regards to the presentation? BJ, go ahead. 
I measure it as a really good presentation because I'm jotting questions down as I'm hearing it and I'm crossing them off as I'm going along. So good job on that. Trout in the classroom start as our eggs and are ultimately released, if they're lucky and they do a good job, by the students in the local waterways. So where does that fit in? Is that it's okay because there are eggs? Where, where, where's that? That's a great question. And during the process of developing this, one of the first things we brought up is we wanted to look at um, what programs do we have internally that this may impact? And one of them was trout in the classroom. So yes, those, those eggs are coming from, from us. They're being raised and they're being uh, stocked in the waters. The one thing with that is, is prior to any stocking occurring, the Division of Fisheries Management and Consultation um, with, with other bureaus is providing a list of acceptable waters to TIC programs in advance of the stocking occurring. So we know where they're stocking fish in the list that we provided, knowing that they're stocking rainbow trout and knowing the quantities of fish that they're releasing, we've already signed off and said, yes, we approve of this. So that's all that's on your list. That was, that was it. They answered the question that I had as they went along. Okay. Uh, Eric. Yeah, under this whole umbrella, it's going to eliminate someone from the southeast taking fish out and release them in south, southwestern waters. Correct. Because they yep. don't have an authorization to stop. <laughs> Yeah, so the author that they, practice that happens where people make fish out of a waterway, move into another waterway under this umbrella. The, the movement of, of, of anglers um, catching a fish from water, one water body and deciding to stock it into a pond or another water body isn't necessarily covered in 71.5, but it's part of the chapter 71 rewrite. It, just just liberating any fish without approval. I'm not sure exactly how it's Hey, Don. Thanks for nice presentation today. Partial aquaculture can put into this. We see pretty much in the Well, it is a change, Commissioner, for them, and there have been a lot of discussions with them over the last several years as they, we saw this coming and we've been working on it with them. And we have had comments from them throughout the period. We adjusted the proposed rulemaking based on a lot of their comments. So I, I think we've, we've addressed most of them. There still may be a little pushback because it's a change, but a lot of it's going to be good, not only for our anglers out there, but for the fish farms, because it's going to help protect Pennsylvania from other pathogens coming into the state. Uh, this isn't a question. I, I just want to compliment you and your staff for all the work was done on this program. You can tell that you went into a lot of detail and a lot of study. And um, for me, my my first day on this commission, this has been a priority for me. Uh, we we didn't have anybody taking responsibility for what was going on. And I commend, I commend you guys, you did a fantastic job. And if I could build on that, Charlie, I, I um, had the honor of getting on the board in summer of 2017 and the very first meeting I went to uh, was with uh, the advisory committee, Brian was there. I think Tim, you were along with that and um, You've been working on it since then um, because the issues were coming up then. And as Charlie said, you know, we, we really compliment you for taking the time methodically working with the people and and coming up at this point with 
you know, with with what I hope we all can live with. So it's been a long process, and I, I agree with Charlie. Thank you. If I may, go I'll ahead, Brian. Say that uh, earlier when I was talking, I mentioned we work with the aquaculture community. They were the very first people that saw the draft of our proposed rulemaking before we even brought it to you because we wanted to make sure that they had some say in it and some buy in and were able to make comments and we were able to address it. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in um, the hopefully or ideally in 2025, you'll have the option either electronic submission or if somebody wants to submit an application, you know, through through the mail or hand deliver it, that option will still be available. Yes. Good question. Uh, <clears throat> good question, Commissioner. Yeah, it'll be very similar, you know, whether it's New Jersey or New. In my opinion, yes. Just going back to 2016, I was here then. They we required a certification. It wasn't the department that we required it. Right, we, we developed the Google Health certification process. Yeah, that came from us. And it's their responsibility. <clears throat> sure, it, it, for their jurisdiction, they're limited to dangerous transmissible diseases. So defining that term, what does that mean? It's actually anything within their statute. I'm, I'm not going to play lawyer for the Department of Ag, but they can add and uh, take things off the list as needed, whatever they consider to be. Uh, I think they only have two things really on the fish list for their dangerous and transmissible. It's the, the VHS. We did that jointly together back when that came up. And their other one is uh, the tilapia virus, correct? Those are the only two that they have on the fish list. 
And then if I might, I also just wanted to, to compliment staff um, for all the work that's gone into it. Reminder, this is in our strategic plan that, that the board approved as a priority, but just it's been an absolute team effort. Um, and I'll, you know, to put it into context, and when we talk to the Department of Agriculture, this is a live animal aquaculture product. And if you're moving pigs or chickens or cows or deer, I mean, you hear about a lot right now with chronic wasting disease, avian influenza. Um, this just gets us to where we need to be when it comes to fish. And again, to Bill Brock's question, consistent with other states. And I, I said it to the industry and I meant it. Um, you know, we want to protect the aquatic resources of the Commonwealth and have healthy aquatic wild fish um, everywhere. And we would also like to have a thriving aquaculture industry. And our goal here is to achieve both. And what we think we've, we've taken a big step with this. So just hats off to the team for, for what they put together. I have one more question there for staff, Rick. Back, uh, I guess it was 2016, Director Arway had not allowed cooperative nurseries to have commercial fish on site. Uh, with the passage of this, and of course, clubs being able to get disease-free certified fish, can we go back to where a club could have both cooperative nursery fish and commercially propagated fish on their property? I know they would need to keep them separate, uh, but can we go back to that format where commercial fish would be allowed? Would I, would, I know it's I know yeah. it's important for them for fundraising sure. purposes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be prepared to give an answer on that at this point, Don. But is that something we could we can look at could, seriously in the future? We can always consider anything, but wouldn't be prepared to make a statement about that right okay. now. Or does anybody see any problem to that that it would be totally not doable? Again, that hasn't really come okay. up in the context of this, Don. So if we could, I mean, thanks for raising it. We'll discuss okay. it and be happy to get back That's on that. That's a concern I would have, and I would hope we could work that out. Yep. Yeah, I'll have the staff to work on that. Any further questions before we act on the recommendation from staff? Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation that the staff presented on this? I will make that motion. I think they said Charlie's hand oh, first. Well, then I'll follow Charlie and offer the second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any, any further discussion where we call for a vote? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, team. Are we, yeah, we'll continue. And I, I think it's now time for Chris Kuhn to have, okay, Chris. It is, thank you, Commissioner Kaufman. Uh, welcome commissioners, good morning. And those of us joining us here in, in person and tuning in virtually, I'm Chris Kuhn. I'm the director of the Bureau of Fisheries. And I'm going to be uh, presenting the next item on the agenda, which is specifically to do deal with uh, the American shad fishery in the Delaware Basin. Uh, specifically, that is uh, 58 PA code section 60 
1.2, and the, the, the proposal is essentially to address the uh, American shad daily krill limit. But before I jump into the proposal, I'm just going to give a little bit of background information about American shad as a species and some of the management bodies that are responsible for uh, setting regulations and managing American shad, not only on the Delaware Basin, but also up and down the Atlantic coast. So American shad are an adromous species. And, and what I mean by that, it's similar to salmon. Uh, the adults inhabit the marine waters of the Atlantic Ocean and then return annually to freshwater habitats in, in rivers and small, small streams to, to some extent, um, small rivers rather, um, to spawn. And after they spawn, then the young utilize those habitats in freshwater as nursery habitat before out migrating uh, back out into uh, the Atlantic coast, Ocean. And so um, we have state, federal, and tribal jurisdictions that jointly manage American shad along the Atlantic coast, uh, two of which are listed here. One is the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, or ASMFC. Uh, Tim Schaefer is the administrative proxy or administrative commissioner on the ASMFC, and, and I serve as the proxy on, on that body. And also we have, specific to the Delaware, the Delaware River Basin Fish and Wildlife Management Cooperative, or the co-op. Again, I sit on that body as a representative to the policy committee. We also have staff that uh, um, participate in, in the co-op from the technical aspect. Uh, the Delaware River Basin uh, states jointly then uh, through a cooperative process with ASMFC as well as the co-op submit what is called a sustainable fisheries management plan. And that is done in order to continue to allow for a, a fishery in the waters within the Bel Delaware Basin. When I say about a fishery, I'm talking not only about managing the population of fish, but also the, the human users that, 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 that enact some type of fishing mortality on the population itself. And so the most recent stock assessment was done in 2020 and it determined, and that was by the ASMSC, determined that the Delaware River population is experiencing what is technically referred to as unsustainable mortality. So in other words, the stock is depleted to a point that uh, the mortality that is being inflicted on it will not allow it to rebuild under those circumstances. So co-op members on, on, the, on the policy committee uh, agreed, met and agreed to reduce American shad harvest by approximately 33% for both the recreational and commercial fisheries. So not only is Pennsylvania uh, a, a member of the co-op, we also have New York, New Jersey, and Delaware on the co-op. And so I, re I reference both recreational and commercial fisheries. Pennsylvania does not have a commercial fishery in, in the waters of the Delaware Estuary or Delaware River. However, we do have a very popular recreational fishery uh, in the Delaware River Basin. And currently we have a krill limit, daily krill limit of two fish per day for American shad. And given the agreed upon 33% reduction from all the co-op members, uh, we're recommending that we reduce that three fish limit to a two fish limit per day. And that is specific to waters in the Delaware uh, River Basin or those managed under section 61.2. And New York, New Jersey, as well as Delaware are also seeking similar reductions to the daily krill limits uh, for recreational, um, uh, daily krill limits within their jurisdictional waters in the Delaware Basin. And currently, right now, uh, New York, as well as New Jersey, also have a three fish daily limit. So if we were to make this change, all, all three of the states would align with a two fish uh, limit for American shad. So with that, uh, the staff recommendation is that the commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the amendments described in the commentary. If adopted on final rulemaking, these amendments will go into effect on January 1st, 2023. Okay, thank you, Chris. Any any questions for Chris? Yeah. Uh, Bill? 
likelihood of New York and New Jersey making those same changes to children that all likelihood going to happen. It is, and in, in the intent by the, the, the members of the co-op that also sit on the policy committee uh, from New York and New Jersey have have committed to that that change, that 33% reduction. That means this should begin next year as well. That's the intent, yes. I'll make a motion. We accept the staff recommendation. Is there a second? Is there a second to the motion? Seconded by Commissioner Gibney. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Next. Introduce Dave Nyhart. All right, good afternoon again. Um, my name is David Nyard. I'm the Chief of the Division of Fisheries Management. The next designation is proposed changes to the Class A wild trout streams uh, list. The proposal uh, was published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin on February 12th of 2022. Although um, kind of staying true to how these have been done over the last year and a half, two years, the individual waters will not be presented during this presentation, but they were made available and are available on our commission's website, and they're also included in today's agenda and were provided to all the commissioners well in advance of today's meeting for review. So while this out for public comment, uh, the commission received a total of 228 public comments regarding the proposed designations. All of them supported the proposal. I will mention that uh, following staff review, none of these waters are stocked by the commission and none of these waters are stocked by a cooperative nursery, and there are no special activities permits um, for any of these waters. So there's no stocking occurring on any of these, these sections of Class A that are being proposed today. Staff recommend the commission add seven stream sections to its Class A wild trout streams list, as described in the commentary. If approved, these additions will go into effect upon publication of a second notice in the PA bulletin. Okay, is there any questions for Dave? Hearing none, I'll make that motion. Okay, motion's been made to accept the staff recommendation. Is there a second? Okay, Commissioner Brock seconded the motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, signify by saying aye if, appro if, if approved. <laughs> aye. Opposed? Motion carried. And tell him I'm getting hungry. Okay, Dave. All right, thank you, President Kaufman. So the, the next item on the agenda is another designation. This is specific to the classification of wild trout streams proposed additions. This is also published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin on February 12th of this year. Similar to the Class A uh, waters, they will not be discussed individually during this presentation, but are available on our commission's website and included in today's agenda as well. Um, it's worth noting that a wild trout designation does not mean a water can never be stocked. That uh, stocking, um, the elimination of stocking only applies to the Class A water. So a water being listed as wild trout does not impact whether or not it can be stocked by us, a cooperative nursery or, or a member of the public. The commission received 220 public, 226 public comments when it was open for um, comment. 224 support, supported the proposal, and two did not pertain to the proposal. So staff recommend the commission add 23 new waters to the commission's wild trout streams list as set forth in the notice of proposed designations. If approved, these additions will go into effect upon publication of a second notice in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Any questions for Dave? Hearing none. Do we have a motion to a to accept the staff recommendation? I'll make that motion. Commissioner Hussar. Seconded by Commissioner Brock. Any further questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Another item for Dave. Thank you, President Coffin. So the final designation for the fisheries portion today 
uh, is removal of Dingman's Creek Section 3, which is located in Pike County from the delayed harvest artificial lures only program. So Section 3 extends for 1.6 miles from Deer Leap Falls downstream to Dingman's Fall. And you can see on the map here, um, shows you where the stream is located in Pike County and then just kind of a, a um, another view of the map or another a map of just the Pacific stream, specific stream section. So Dingman's Creek Section 3 uh, is managed as a stock trout water. It was also included in our delayed harvest artificial ores only program back in January of 1992. This stream section is located completely within the Delaware Water Gap National uh, Recreational Area. So access to Section 3 is really limited. There's one access road, Doodle Hollow Road, um, that provides the only access, and it parallels most of Section 3 uh, for a substantial length of the entire section. Staff were notified back in, in December of 2021 that the road was in very poor condition, and, and the, the condition of the road was not going to be addressed by the National Park Service. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, that's really the only access to that stream section and given its, its current condition, it didn't provide for a very good, a safe access to allow for stocking. As a result of that, we had to remove it from the Stock Trout Waters Program for 2022. The DH program, the D Delayed Harvest Artificial Lures Only Program, is designed to be maintained, uh, the recreational fishery is designed to be maintained through stocking. As a result of it being removed from the Stock Trout Waters Program, it's no longer being stocked, and that recreational opportunities that um, justified it being in the DH program is no longer there. So following the cessation of stocking in 2022, um, Section 3 should be removed from the DH program as well because it's no longer being stocked. So unfortunately, yes, you know, uh, Section 3 is no longer stocked and should be removed from the DH program, but on a, a positive note, Section 4, which is immediately downstream of Section 3, so on the map, Section three is, is the blue line and section four is the orange line. So you can see they're adjacent to each other. Um, staff are currently working with the National Park Service to determine the suitability of adding section four to the Stock Trout Waters Program and also to the DH program beginning in 2023. So potentially lo or losing section three, um, but hopefully adding section four, uh, keeping this, this opportunity in that area. Section four extends from Dingman's Falls downstream 2.1 miles to the mouth. So it's slightly longer, about a half mile longer than the current section three that's in the program. The designation was put out on the PA bulletin on March 5th for public, March 5th for public comment. We did not receive any public comments on the proposed designation. So staff recommend the commission remove Dingman's Creek section three from the DH area program. If approved, Dingman's Creek Section 3 will revert to Commonwealth Inland Waters regulations upon publication of a second notice in the PA Bulletin. Okay, any questions for Dave? Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept the staff recommendation? I'll move to accept the staff recommendation to remove Dingman's Creek from delayed harvest. And Commissioner Gibney? I'll make a second. And Commissioner Anderson second the motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, thank you, President Coffin. So the last item on the fisheries agenda is other matters, uh, specifically the proposed exemptions the PA code 57.8A class A wild trout streams to allow the continued stocking of two class A stream sections. So historically, there were very few class A streams where stocking should be considered or warranted. As you guys remember in at the January 2021 commission meeting, staff brought before you um, a list of, of 13 events that were occurring on 12 class A sections. And they were identified by looking at some of the exemptions that were listed below as why they were brought before the board for consideration. So as, as mentioned, there are rare scenarios where staff think that a, a stocking should be continued on a class A section. And they include pre-existing youth derbies, either held by a private club or, or a, a fishing club or a private landowners. 
private stockings that were not known to the commission at the time of the listing uh, as class A designation. And then also the criteria that was used back in 2015 by staff when we uh, brought before the board at the time 10 waters using criteria that we, 10 class A stream sections that we currently stock. Later, there was three more added in 2016. And lastly, if they, received, if they received a previous exemption from the commission for the stocking of a class A water. So I mentioned that staff have developed criteria um, that should be considered for um, looking at waters. And I will say that in February of 2022, so just a few months ago, staff updated the operational guidelines for the management of trout in Pennsylvania. And within that guidelines, one of the appendixes has these list the, the criteria. So it's available to the public and it's available on our website. So we're being very transparent about this and it is out there uh, for the public to view. So we have four criteria uh, that we look at and the first one being pre-existing youth derbies and special use areas. And these would be areas that were properly permitted by the commission have a history of more one occurrence, uh, one more one past occurrence. Pre-existing private stockings on, stockings on private property on a newly designated Class A stream section. They must be closed to the public and also have to have records where they, they can verify that stocking was occurring prior to the Class A designation. The next stream section stocked by the commission, proper nursery and or private group, uh, the year prior to the designation have a history of more than one past occurrence meeting the following sub criteria um, that is outlined here. The next is previously received an exemption for a special activities permit by the commission. Um, and if it's time limited or expired, it, it will we'll consider the request is new. So following a review, as I mentioned before, um, we brought before you the, the 12 or the 13 events on 12 waters last year. And that was done by, you know, really an agency wide review of all the stockings that are occurring in you know, coordination with the Bureau of Fisheries, Bureau of Hatchery, Bureau of Law Enforcement is how we identified those waters. Uh, recently, within the last few months, uh, following some additional review, um, it was brought to our attention that there's two more of these events occurring. So that's why we're bringing them before you today. Um, and you'll see here, Penns Creek Section 2 and Poapoca Creek Section 4. Both of these sections were included in the 10 original waters that were provided exemptions for back in 2015. But at the time, the exemptions were only provided to allow the Fish and Boat Commission to continue their stocking. It did not apply to outside group stocking these sections. So these two sections should be fairly uh, uh, familiar. So the first one is on Penns Creek Section 2, which is in Center County and Commissioner District 3. The event that is occurring here is a general fishing derby that allows for the participation of youth and adults. The next one is on Poe Poco Creek Section 4, which is located in Carbon County and, and Commissioner District 7. And this is a this is a stocking that is occurring by a, a private individual on a water open to the public, and it meets the criteria that was outlined in section or in, in under criterion three that was previously listed. So the criteria that was developed uh, and used ultimately in 2015 to allow the stocking of uh, the, the 10, at the time, 10 waters that our agency stocked. Should an exemption be granted, the, com the commission will consider the following. The species and number that can be stocked, the frequency of stockings, and the section limits within the specific section where stocking is permitted. Stocking provisions will be communicated in writing by the commission to the entity receiving the exemption. So um, this is done. We, we send up an email following the approval to the group, and it's also followed up by a letter in the mail. Stocking exemptions will be valid for no more than five years. So the ones that, if, if it gets approved today, they will be valid for five years, meaning they'll expire at the end of, of 2026. This was put out for public comment on March 12th of this year. The commission received a total of four public comments, three oppose the proposal, and one does not pertain to the proposal. Staff recommend the commission approve two exemptions to, PA, to 58 PA code 57.8A Class A wild trout streams to allow for the continued stocking of trout at two Class A stream sections as described in the commentary. Okay, are there any questions for Dave? Eric? 
are they required a uh, special activities permit every year then? So is that how we keep the paper trail? So the, that, that's a great question. So any, any of these exemptions that have been provided in the past, if it's for a, a youth derby, children's or anything that requires a special activities permit, they're still required to submit one of them every year. For private stockings that are required at the end of the year to provide the information on the number of number that are actually stocked in the species to the local AFM. So we have a record of that. So, so in the future, 2025, if, they're, if they are, that's gonna be part of our process in regard to the stocking authorization is an SAP, right? Yeah, even the, the approval of these, so when they expire, you know, after five years, they'll be brought back for the board and it'd be up to the board to decide whether they want to grant another exemption or not. Okay. I'm familiar with the Pence Creek section. I'm not familiar with the, um, the other one, though. So, thanks. And group, groups are aware that this is kind of on a five-year plan that we, we can come back then. Correct, and that's detailed in the letter that they'll receive. It's in there indicating that it's it's valid for five years. I have no, they don't. It, it, it it's valid for five years, whether or not they stock each year. Okay, Dan, I saw you had your hand up. I'm sorry, Charlie. Did you did you have us? Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the authorization for up to five years? And in either of these cases, did you consider? Well, I guess what are we, what are we approving? A five year? You're you're approval? you're approving an exemption for five years, but in the in the letter it does say that uh, I don't have one in front of me, but it basically that could change. Um, it, it could be rescinded or additional information becomes available where. It's no longer valid, but the, the today you're voting to provide one for five years. Are we providing any of the stocking for those two? I didn't, I'm sorry, Commissioner Charles. What was that? Are are we providing the fish for any of those two stockings? We are not. We're not, and they've uh, they've in the past applied for a special. Uh, event permit, both organizations? Only one of these organizations. The, the Penn's Creek uh, is the one that has applied for a special activities permit in the past. Well, the other one. I, I, I know of class A streams that uh, these special events, uh, kids derbies and things like that are, are just that. It's a you know, a special permit for the the uh, the derby or whatever they're having. I I can't see what's wrong with that. Why do we have to give them a five year? Why can't they apply each year for their special permit? Well, they they still have to apply for a special activities permit annually. Um, but they also have to have, you know, knowing that it, it's being stocked in, in a class A and according to 57.8A, it's illegal to stock in a water designated as a class A without getting approval of the executive director and the board. That's where this comes into play. It, it, it's, it's allowing them to stock those fish as part of their special activity. But we're giving them a carte blanche. So they, could, they could stock 10 times in a year if they chose to. No. So no? it, it, I don't know how to go back on this. So should an, should an exemption be granted, we're determining the species, the number and the frequency which stocking to it can occur. And all this is gonna be detailed in the letter they receive from the Fish and Boat Commission. So just as an example, if a organization was holding a youth derby one day a year and they were stocking 200 rainbow trout. That's going to be detailed in their letter. This is all the more you were authorized to do this and no more. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Okay. Oh, sorry, Richard. I uh, received a letter and I think the rest of the commissioners received a letter uh, on, on a previous uh, 
issue that we talked about with regard to stocking uh, trout on a class A stream and had, it was a meeting or two ago, had to do with Freeman Run up in Bill Brock's area. And I guess what I'm in support of what you're doing here, but I guess my question is what occurs or what occurred at Freeman's Run, uh, they had asked us to, it was a cooperative nursery, they had asked us to be able to continue stocking there. W what criteria or what occurred there that made the staff not think that that was a good idea to uh, to, con to continue stocking in Freeman's Run? Yeah, good question. So Freeman Run, uh, specifically Freeman Run sections three and sections four, were stocked by uh, our agency and also stocked by a cooperative nursery. So given who's doing the stocking, we fall back into uh, sub-criteria three. So it did not meet the criteria outlined in criteria three. For that reason, we didn't request that the board provide an exemption to allow us or a co-op nursery to stock. However, Potter County Anglers, who stocks Freeman Run, also had a youth event held on that stream section. They were provided an exemption in January of 2021 by the board to continue to hold that event. They were holding that event up near Austin Dam, which um, I guess would be, it's, it's at the, uh, in section three. That area no longer uh, was conducive to their event. So they requested this year to move their event downstream. That was provided and they were received a letter in the mail indicating that they were authorized to move their event from the Austin Dam area down to the high school area, which allowed them to host a better event. So. They're still holding a stocking for the children's event on that stream section. Good. I, I appreciate that. It's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right. Do I have a motion to accept the staff recommendation presented? I'll make a motion to accept the staff recommendation. Okay. Commissioner Anderson, is there a second? Second from Richard. Richard. Seconded the motion. Any further? Discussion, comment? Hearing none. Do I have a, do a motion to, do I have a, a motion to, is there, there's a motion? All those in favor. I'm hungry. All those in favor, <laughs> signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? No. Okay. Motion carried. All right. I'm going to break for lunch because I understand lunch is available. Um, commissioners, we're going to meet. Um, in the uh, Delaware room and have a working lunch and we'll get back here. Let's get back at uh, five minutes after one o'clock. Let's reconvene the, our meeting. It's pretty Thank cool. You. Yeah. Thank you. And we're going to start with public access and real estate matters. Linda Adler. Good afternoon. There you are. Here. Welcome back. See, Bob's too tall. I didn't even see you. Thank you. Our first item up on the agenda for property services is the Fish and Boat Commission property um, at Belmont Lake. Um, Fish Commission owns a 404 acre property in Mount Pleasant and Preston Townships in Wayne County containing 172 acre lake known as Belmont Lake. Belmont Lake is located approximately 30 miles northeast of Scranton, as depicted on the exhibit. When the commission acquired the property from the Wayne Storage Water Power Company in 1917, the conveyance also included the right to flow water to the top of the existing dam as originally constructed. This flowage right is known as a flowage easement which is the right to periodically flow water on, inundate, and flood an area without liability for damages resulting from such action. Belmont Lake Dam was originally constructed by the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company in 1830 and reconstructed by the commission in 1958. The dam is currently classified as a high hazard, unsafe dam and does not meet Department of Environmental Protection standards for the spillway capacity and embankment stability. Designed to rehabilitate the dam to bring it into compliance with current 
regulatory dam safety standards is complete and construction is expected to begin in 2023. When the dam was reconstructed in 1958, it was designed to allow for the utilization of the existing flowage rights as previously described and to meet the design and regulatory standards in place at that time. Due to current changes in regulatory standards, the dam's rehabilitation will require raising the dam approximately three feet. Thus, there will be an area outside of the original flowage rights boundary that will be inundated. This area will need to be acquired as flowage easements. Flowage easements are expected to have minimal value the commission will pay the estimated fair market value of the rights or accept donations if offered. The flow easement areas are estimated to be approximately six acres and will include approximately two parcels. Located in Preston Township as depicted on the exhibit. There are two different affected properties requiring flow easements totaling five four. 0.46 as determined by document research and property surveys. Staff will pursue the acquisition of the new easement areas in an amicable manner and will only utilize the Commonwealth's power of eminent domain as a last resort. Additionally, staff will adhere to the Commission's standard practices for acquiring property, including meeting the due diligence and funding requirements. Staff recommend that the commission authorize the acquisition of the flow easements in Preston Township, Wayne County, as more particularly described in the commentary. Okay, is there any questions for Linda? Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? I move to accept the recommendation for, for the staff to acquire the uh, acquisition easement for Belmont Lake. And Commissioner Givney, second. All second. Commissioner Anderson seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. The next item is also in Wayne County. The Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission owns a 104 acre property in Mount Pleasant Township, Wayne County, previously containing a 61 acre lake known as Miller Pond. Miller Pond is located approximately 35 miles northeast of Scranton, Pennsylvania on Miller Pond Road, as depicted on the exhibit. When the commission acquired the property from the Wayne Storage Water Power Company in 1917, the conveyance also included the right of flowage to flow water to the top of the existing dam as originally constructed. This flowage right is known as a flowage easement, which is the right to periodically flow water on, inundate and flood an area without liability of for damage resulting from such action. Miller Pond Dam was constructed by the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company prior to 1860. The dam is currently classified as a high hazard unsafe dam by the Pennsylvania Department of Protection. The lake was drained in June of 2015 in advance of the anticipated rehabilitation of the dam, which is required to bring the dam into compliance with current regulatory dam safety standards. To bring the dam into compliance, the breast, the dam breast will be removed approximately 75 feet upstream from the original location. Top of the dam will be lowered and the dam breast widened. Design for the rehabilitation of the dam is complete and submitted to DEP for permitting review. Construction is expected to begin after the DEP permitting review process is complete. When the dam was originally constructed, flowage rights were acquired as previously described. When the new design, additional flowage rights will be, will not be required, but recent documentation research and surveys have revealed 
that a small area was previously missed during the original acquisition and is not covered by the existing float flowage rights. A flowage easement will need to be acquired on this small area. Additionally, the relocation and widening of the dam breast will require the fee simple acquisition of a small portion of land from an adjacent property. The flowage easement and fee simple acquisition are expected to have minimal value. The commission will pay the estimated fair market value of the rights or accept donations if offered. Flow easement area is estimated to be approximately 0 0.1 acres and the fee simple acquisition will require an approved subdivision and is estimated to be approximately 0 0.7 acres. The exact acreage and number of affected properties will be determined by document research and property subdivision surveys. Staff will pursue the acquisition of flowage easement and fee simple area in an amicable manner and will only utilize the Commonwealth's power of eminent domain as a last resort. Additionally, staff will adhere to the commission commission standard practices for acquiring property, including meeting the due diligence and funding requirements. Staff recommend that the commission authorize the acquisition of the flowage easements and fee simple acquisition in Mount Pleasant Township, Wayne County, as more particularly described in the commentary. Okay, any questions in regard to the presentation? Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? John? I move that we accept the staff recommendation. Okay, Commissioner Mon, second. I'll second. Rick. Commissioner Hussar seconded the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, Linda, continue. The next item is a lease in Adams County. Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission acquired a 58 acre tract of land located along Conewago Creek along Russell Tavern Road and Ziegler Mill Road in Butler Township, Adams County. From the Land Conservancy of Adams County, the, land, the Adams County Chapter 323 Trot Unlimited, uh, the Northern Virginia Trot Unlimited Chapter and the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources partnered with the Conservancy to acquire the land from Nouse Foods. The location is depicted on the exhibit. And the lease area is depicted on this exhibit. The property contains a portion of Conewago Creek that is designated as a catch and release fly fishing only section that provides significant trout fishing opportunities in this area. This section of Conewago Creek is stocked by the commission, the McSherry Town and Nouse Foods, Ortana, Cooperative Fish Hatcheries and the Mamasburg Sportsman's Club. Fly fishing catch and release section has been managed by the Adams County Trout Unlimited and the Northern Virginia Trout Unlimited chapters for over 30 years. The Adams County Trout Unlimited wishes to enter into a lease with the commission to continue their conservation efforts. The lease will be for a 25 year term and the Adams County Trot Unlimited will be responsible for the routine maintenance, operation, repair, and supervision of the lease area. The lease will also require the site to remain open to the public for public fishing and boating free of charge. Fishing and boating will take precedence over all other recreational activities. The leasing of the property is in the best interest of the commission. Staff recommend that the commission authorize the leasing of the Conewago Creek Ziegler Mill Road access property to the Adams County Trot Unlimited as more particularly described in the commentary. Okay, thank you, Linda. Any questions? We have a motion to accept the recommendation. 
And I, and I will second that. Commissioner Lewin, Lewis made the motion, seconded by Commissioner Small. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Shaw's Landing property. So the next item is related to a PennDOT project in Crawford County. Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission owns 4,605 acres known as Shaw's Landing in Union Township of Crawford County. The site was acquired using Project 70 funding. It is located about three miles northwest of Cochranton, as depicted on the exhibit. Pennsylvania Department of Transportation is proposing to address the Project 70 funding issue with a request for a non-conversion determination in the form of a waiver letter. The Whiteman Road Bridge Rehabilitation Project would rehabilitate a structurally deficient historic truss bridge over Conneaut Outlet. The proposed bridge would be constructed on the same horizontal alignment as it is today. Part of the bridge rehabilitation would include extending the wing walls and regrading the roadway slope. Temporary construction easement would be required to facilitate construction of the project. This area is needed to construct a crane pad and to provide a laydown area to dismantle the structure once it is removed from the abutments and to reassemble it once it has been rehabilitated offsite. The project will need property rights from the commission. The project area requires 0 0.0165 acres of permanent slope right away and 0 0.3245 acres of temporary construction easement. These areas are shown on the exhibit. Temporary construction easement will revert back to the commission at the end of construction and a portion of it may be used by the commission and public during construction for access. Usually legislative legislation is required on project 70 acquired property. However, since the take area is very small and the impact is not significant, the staff of both the commission and PennDOT have agreed to pursue a waiver of the legislation requirement through an established waiver process. This process is designed to save the Commonwealth time and effort in minor conveyances for the public good. The commission's legal staff shall approve the process before there is any commitment to a conveyance. The project will not have a long-term adverse impact on the site and will improve public safety. The commission will receive fair market value for the rights it conveys and any impact on the site. The site will be restored to the Commonwealth to the commission's satisfaction. This conveyance will be subject to staff performing the necessary due diligence. Staff recommend the commission authorize this project in Wayne County at the Shaw's Landing property. Hey, is there any questions for this part of the presentation? Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept the staff recommendation? John? And Commissioner Mon made the motion, seconded, seconded by Commissioner Anderson. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed. Motion carried. Okay. And Lake Winola access. So the last item is a property disposition um, in Lake Winola and. Wyoming County, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission owns a 32 acre property containing a portion of Lake Winola and includes a public fishing and boating access area in Overfield Township, Wyoming County, known as Lake Winola Access. The Lake Winola Access is located 
on the south end of the lake, Winola, and is 15 miles northeast of Scranton, as depicted on the exhibit. This property was acquired in 1969. In 2001, the commission discovered that an adjacent commercial eating establishment known as the cafe was encroaching on a small portion of the Lake Winola access property. The cafe owner inadvertently developed additional gravel parking and constructed half of an open air dining pavilion on the Lake Winola access property. At that time, the encroachment was considered de minimis and was con decided that an agreement would be executed to address the use of the encroachment area by the cafe owner and to protect and indemnify the commission. The agreement required the cafe owner to pay the commission $125 fee for the first year, increasing annually 2% each year after. In 2021, the cafe property was conveyed to Sterling Realty of New York. Sterling Realty desires to acquire the encroachment area to resolve the property use issue. The proposed disposition area is 0.1 acres as depicted on the exhibit. An approved subdivision plan will determine the final acreage and configuration. Sterling Realty has agreed to pay the commission $5,000 for the proposed disposition area. The property to be conveyed is not actively used by the commission and its disposition will not adversely impact the commission, its operations or future plans to utilize or further develop the property. Commission staff have evaluated the request and determined that it is in the best interest of both parties to bring these issues to a close. Sterling Realty will be responsible for all costs associated with the conveyance, including subdivision and recording costs. In addition, any real estate and transfer taxes that are normally shared between the buyer and the seller will be paid by Sterling Realty. The commission will retain all oil, gas, coal, and mineral rights on the property being conveyed. In addition, staff will adhere to the commission's standard practices for property disposition, including meeting due diligence requirements. Staff recommend that the commission authorize the disposition of property at Lake Winola access as described in the commentary. Okay, any questions, Linda? Having none, do I hear a motion to accept the staff recommendation? I make a motion that we accept the staff recommendation that the commission authorize the disposition of the property at Lake Winona Access. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Charlesworth. Second? I'll second that motion. Commissioner Gibney seconded the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, thank you, Linda. Okay, next up, Erie Access Improvement Program, Scott Pollack. Good afternoon, Commissioners. <sighs> Staff has one project under the Erie Access Improvement Program for consideration today. It is a grant to the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority for the Parade Street Public Access Rehabilitation along Prescott Bay in Erie County. The Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority owns the Parade Street Dock along Prescott Bay. Parade Street Dock has been open and available to, public, to the public for fishing for many years. It is considered a very popular urban fishing destination and it has been highly utilized. Due to recent um, historic high water levels in Lake Erie, the public access wall was undermined and has failed. The facility was closed in 2021 because of uh, the failing public access wall. It resulted in large cracks in the sidewalk, which created a safe, serious safety issue. Project area 
is near the intermodal transportation center, provides access to the site bus for inner city fishermen. It is also next to a free public parking lot uh, that provides access for anyone who has a car. It is also adjacent to the uh, Bayfront bike and pedestrian paths. In these photos, you can see that the retaining wall is undermined and it's resulted in destroying the sidewalk and I actually totally, they just went in and totally eliminated it, but uh, it was definitely not safe. So the Erie Port Authority partnered with the Sons of Lake Erie Fishing Club to request funds to reconstruct the handicapped accessible fishing area of roughly 135 feet. The funds will be used to construct a new sheet pile retaining wall um, the concrete walkway and to install safety ladders. The facility will be ADA accessible with an accessible parking area adjacent to the site. Uh, the total estimated cost for the project is $342,700. The Port Authority is requesting $248,700 from the Erie Access Improvement Pro Pro Program for this project. The Port Authority will provide matching funds in the amount of $94,000. Staff recommend that the Commission approve a grant not to exceed $248,700 to the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority to rehabilitate the Parade Street public access, utilizing monies from the Lake Erie Restricted Account. Hey, is there any questions for Scott from his presentation? I'll make a motion to accept the staff recommendation. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Anderson. I would second. I would second that. Commissioner Small seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the recommendation signify and the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, thank you, Scott. That and Boating facility grant program. <sighs> Still have the floor, Scott. Thank you. Okay. Next, we're going to move into the boating facility grant program. But we start out with a brief overview of the grant round and then move into the projects that are on the agenda for the commission consideration today. Um, during the 2022 round of the Boating Facility Grant Program, staff received a total of 15 applications. The, funding, the requested funding levels for the individual projects range from $13,500 to $245,700. The total amount of funding requested from the Boating Facility Grant Program for all 15 projects was $1.57 million. Staff evaluated and reviewed all of these projects um, and recommended 12 for funding. <clears throat> these are the 12 that you can see on the map. Sorry, the color doesn't show up as well as I thought it would, but hopefully you can see them. Um, <clears throat> seven of these projects could, are, are able to be approved by the executive director. The remaining five are on the agenda today. Uh, the projects you see highlighted in the Delaware River watershed, which is the area obviously on the east side highlighted in beige, may be funded with a $400,000 grant we, we, that we received from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation through the Delaware River Conservation Act program. This is the list of the seven projects that may be approved by the executive director. Uh, if you will, under the boating facility grant program, projects that are development projects that are $100,000 or less can be approved by the executive director. All property and real estate projects and any development projects over $100,000 um, must be presented to the Board of Commissioners for approval. So, any questions on those? If not, we will move on to the first one on the agenda. It's a grant to the Greene County Commissioners for boat launch and access improvements at Wise Carver Reservoir in Greene County. Uh, in the last year's round of the Boating Facility Grant Program, 
The commission awarded funding in the amount of $85,845 to Greene County to design and construct phase one of the five Wise Carver Reservoir Boat Launch and Access Agreements. Phase one consisted of the con construction of a GeoCell canoe kayak launch, a paved access road, a drop off area for boaters, a gravel path um, to the boat launch, and a storage area. Uh, the, but phase one project is going to be located down near the dam. In this year's round of the boating facility grant program, the Green County Commissioners requested funding to construct a second non motorized boat ramp at the Wise Carver Reservoir. Um, this will be considered phase two of the project. The second facility will actually be located more towards the middle or upper end of the lake. Green County requests funds in the amount of $154,388 to complete phase two. Um, phase two includes the design and construction of a second canoe kayak access in the middle, towards the middle of the lake. They plan to install a 15 foot wide concrete boat launch ramp, a gravel access road, a drop off area for boaters, and an ADA accessible canoe kayak dock system. Matching funds in the amount of $154,388 will be provided by Green County. Um, there are no, uh, no public launches on this facility currently, so with the addition of these two, it will really open up boating on the Wise Carver Reservoir. Staff recommend that the Commission approve a grant not to exceed $154,388 to the Green County Commission. Any questions for Scott? Hearing none, I have a motion to accept the staff recommendation. John? Okay, Commissioner Mon made a motion, seconded by Commissioner Brock. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have the Township of Neville boat launch and dock facility along the Ohio River in Allegheny County. Township of Neville owns an undeveloped property along the Ohio River on Neville Island on the north side of Pittsburgh. Township of Neville is requesting funding and to design and construct a new boat launch facility on their property that will be located on the back channel of the Ohio River. This new facility will offer access for powered and unpowered boats, and the project will provide ADA accessible curb ramps and entry and exit at the site. So this is this is a drawing of the proposed plan for the project. The new facility will consist of a motorized ramp, a canoe kayak ramp, docks, an access road, a parking area, a restroom and signage. The drawing indicates two phases, which you see on the map on the on there, uh, one in green and one in blue. They are actually planning on completing both phases of the project under this grant. Uh, the township of Neville will provide matching funds in the amount of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Currently, there are no launch facilities on Neville Island. The closest one is our Killbuck access, which is actually located on the main channel on the north shore of the river across from Neville Island. However, Neville Island's about 10 miles long um, and upstream of our Killbuck access, there's a lock that prevents you from going upstream and it's a good four or five mile trip to go around the island to get to the back channel side. Staff recommend that the commission approve a grant not to exceed $250,000 to the Township of Neville, Allegheny County. Any questions? John? Ramps 
Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mon. Seconded by by Commissioner Anderson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, next. Middleton Township Children's Lake Boat Launch Park. Right. Yep, next we have a grant to South Middleton Township for the Children's Lake Boat Launch on Long Children's Lake in uh, Cumberland County. Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission actually owns and maintains Children's Lake. Uh, in March of 2022, South Middleton Township entered into a lease agreement with the commission for the area encompassing the boat launch facility. The lease agreement is for a term of 25 years. The current boat launch facility consists of a gravel parking area and a, and a boat launch ramp. There are no delineated trail or sidewalk from the parking area to the existing sidewalk or the boat launch ramp. In addition, the facility is not ADA accessible. South Middleton Township requests funds to make improvements to the boat launch facility. The improvements will include the design and construction of trailways, sidewalks, previous paving of the parking area, ADA accessible improvements, landscaping, lighting, and signage. The project will improve fishing and boating at Children's Lake and provide an ADA accessible boat launch facility, matching funds in the amount of $219,907 will be provided by South Middleton Township. And this is the only boat launch facility on the lake. Staff recommend that the commission approve a grant not to exceed $150,000 to South Middleton Township, Cumberland County. Okay, are there any questions for Scott? Uh, I'd like to make I'd like to make a comment here if I could. Uh, this is the boat ramp on Children's Lake where we are working with South Middleton Township to replace uh, the dam at the end of that lake. So they're all connected. So, um, Richard. Yeah, I, I agree with PJ. I had a question. Um, I thought I heard some comment that something changed and it's going to cost more for them to do this. Could Can we be briefed on that now or we don't wait till some other time? It, the, the estimate for fixing the dam was more than we had expected and we're working right now to try to get additional funds released for the project. Boats in that or no? No, it's all right. Yes, yeah. yeah. it's in Boiling Springs. It's in the And we stock it, it's uh, downstream of the Yellow Breaches. I have a motion to accept the recommendation. I'm happy to make that recommendation. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Small, seconded by Commissioner Lewis. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, next up. Next, we have a grant to the Partnership for the Economic Development of York County and Foundry Park along Cadoras Creek in York County. City of York owns and maintains the Foundry Park Boat Basin along Cadoras Creek. The City of York is partnering with the Partnership for the Economic Development of York County to design and construct a new canoe kayak facility at Foundry Park. This is part of a larger phase one. This, this project is part of phase one of a larger Cadoras Creek Greenway project, which will re revitalize the stream in the City of York. As part of the larger project, the Bascule Dam which is located just downstream of the Foundry Park boat basin will be removed. The dam removal will alter the water level and make the existing boat launch unusable. The Partnership for Economic Development of York County requests funding to design and construct a new boat launch or a new canoe kayak launch. The new boat launch coupled with the removal of the Baskell Dam will open up miles of the Cadoras Creek for use. 
Uh, the new boat launch facility will be handicapped accessible and will meet all current ADA requirements. The facility is an access point on the Cadoris Creek Water Trail. Matching funds for the project in the amount of $250,000 have been um, secured from the Powder Mill Foundation. Staff recommended the commission approve a grant not to exceed $140,000 to the partnership for the economic development of your county. Any questions for Scott? Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? Commissioner Charlesworth? Seconded by Commissioner Brock. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. The last project on the list is um, a grant to uh, the Wayne County Indian Orchard River access along the Lackawaxen River in Wayne County. In May of 2020, Wayne County in partnership with the Wayne Pike Trails and Waterways Alliance completed a trail feasibility study which identified the need for a water trail along the Lackawaxen River from Honesdale to, Hall to Hawley. Uh, it's a stretch of about 10 miles. Wayne County is currently working to establish a new water trail on the Lackawaxen River. In the last round of the boating facility grant program, the commission provided funding for two canoe kayak accesses along the Lackawaxen River. Uh, one of these is at Industrial Point in Honesdale. The second was in White Mills, approximately six miles downstream. Wayne County plans to construct a new canoe kayak access along the Lackawaxen River, Lackawaxen River near Indian Orchard. Um, the properties to be developed are currently owned by the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and the Dime Bank. Wayne County is working with PennDOT and the Dime Bank on either acquiring these properties, uh, receiving the properties as donations, or uh, signing a lease or easement agreement for a term of 25 years. Wayne County requests funds to design and construct a new canoe kayak access that will consist of a paved access road, a paved parking area, a canoe kayak ramp, a restroom, a trail for fishermen, landscaping, and signage. Matching funds for the project will come from the Alliance Foundation in the amount of um, $30,000, the Wayne County Act 13 funds in the amount of $15,000, the Human Resources Foundation um, in the amount of $10,000, uh, $10,000 from the Chatlos Foundation, and they were, were planning on getting a $10,000 do $10, donation from a local Lions Club. The closest public boat launch facilities once completed will be at 3.58 miles upstream at Industrial Point and 2.49 miles downstream at White Mills. Staff recommended the commission approve a grant not to exceed $245,700 to Wayne County. Any questions for Scott? I don't have any questions, but just some comments. This, the group that's been working on this real pro trail project has been doing a, a, an exciting and uh, challenging and great job establishing this roughly nine mile trail. Uh, currently, this this site here would split the difference the distance up um, between Honesdale and the launch site, so making it a, roughly three miles from Honesdale, which would make it far more convenient for kids and youngsters to use it. But we also used this site a while ago as a stocking site. We currently stock above it and below it, so uh, we potentially gain another access for trout fishing on the Lackawaxen. Dan. Uh, Scott, is there's just observe that in all the other ones, the contribution from the other parties was roughly half or more of the total project cost, but this one is the grant is more. Is there some? 
criteria for the amount of the matching funds that have to be put up or is they, it, isn't there? They're, they're supposed to be 50% match, but there is a clause in the, in the voting facility grant uh, procedure guide that allows it to go um, to, to, to vary from that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and just a side note that uh, this also qualifies for for the uh, Delaware Watershed Grant funding too, and is is that right. why there's some right. extra monies that can go into it? Okay, yes. Okay, any other comments? If not, call for a motion. I make a motion that we approve the awarding of the grant to the uh, Wayne County Indian Orchard Access Program. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Gibney. Is there a second? I second that. Commissioner Charlesworth, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Scott. And um, you. That's, a, that's a great program that's really helpful to a, a lot of communities across Pennsylvania. Okay, now turn it over to Laurel Anders for some proposed rulemakings for voting. Laurel? Thanks. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, just wanted to make a note that the next three um, uh, proposed rulemaking items on the agenda were discussed by the Voting Advisory Board at their February 7th meeting, and several of you were at that meeting as members of the Voting Committee. So um, I knew I would forget to mention that at the end of each one of these, so I figured I'd say it right up front. So we have three voting uh, proposed rulemaking items. The first is an amendment to 58 PA code 97.2, which deals with fire extinguishers. And this is on page 48 of your agenda. In October of 2021, the US Coast Guard published a final rule that amended fire extinguishing equipment regulations for basically motorboats. Um, and to give you a little bit of background on that, um, in 2016, the Coast Guard published a notice where um, they were revising fire safety requirements for uninspected or what we would consider recreational vessels. That uh, requirement established that vessel owners must comply with the National Fire Protection Association 10 standards. It required vessel owners and operators to complete monthly visual inspections of portable fire extinguishers, perform annual maintenance of portable fire extinguishers and maintain records of the inspections and maintenance. The 2016 rule was not adopted by the commission at that time. The 2016 rule did not recognize the full burden on recreational vessels. In October of that year, the National Boating Safety Advisory Council recommended to the Coast Guard that they remove the NFPA 10 record keeping requirements for recreational vessels and clarify the vagueness of the phrase good and serviceable that was included um, in that role. So that leads us to this past fall, again, October 21, when the Coast Guard published a rule that amended the requirements and they relieved owners of certain inspection, maintenance and record keeping requirements and established that portable fire extinguishers shall be maintained in good and serviceable condition. On the screen, you see the proposed changes uh, to 97.2 to address um, those changes by the US Coast Guard. The nitty gritty of this one is that we actually define the phrase good and serviceable, and it's contained here on the screen and in your agenda. Fire extinguisher shall not be expired. If it has a pressure gauge reading or indicator in the operable range or position, if there is one, the lock pin must be firmly in place. The discharge nozzle must be clean and free of obstruction, and the extinguisher must not show visible signs of significant corrosion or damage. As I mentioned, this was discussed by the Boating Advisory Board who recommended it to the commission. Staff recommend that the commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the proposed amendment described in the commentary. If adopted on final rulemaking, this amendment will go into effect January 1 of 2023. Any questions? I'd like to list now fire extinguishers are no longer required to have an EA. No, they must um, 
They may still have a gauge depending on when they were manufactured. I'm sorry. It, it says, um, sorry, the previous language was gauges shall be operable and nozzles free of obstruction. Currently, it reads, it has a pressure gauge reading or indicator in the operable range or position, if there is one. Any other questions? Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? So moved. Commissioner Charlesworth, seconded by Commissioner Anderson. Any further comment? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. No. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Go ahead, Laura, continue. Um, just to, to take a quick second before we move on from that one, for those who are following us on the Facebook live feed, I just wanted to mention that on page 50 of the fishing summary and boating handbook, there is an explanation of what motorboats are required to carry fire extinguishers. No change to who's required, just some changes and uh, clarification to the regulations. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Helpful. The next uh, proposed rulemaking is in regard to 58 PA code 111.20 for Crawford County. Woodcock Creek Lake is a 333 acre flood control project that's managed by the US Army Corps of Engineers in Crawford County. The project manager at the site submitted a request through their Pittsburgh district office requesting to change the local policy from a 10 horsepower limitation to a 20 horsepower limitation on the impoundment to allow for increased boating opportunities in response to recent upticks in boating activity. Project staff at the site have requested the commission adopt the same regulatory amendment in Title 58 PA code so our waterways conservation officers can assist with enforcement. This item is on page 50 of your agenda and you can see it on the screen as well. And as I mentioned, this was discussed by our Boating Advisory Board on their uh, February 7th meeting. Staff recommend that the Commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the proposed amendment described in the commentary. If adopted on final rulemaking, this amendment will go into effect January 1, 2023. Okay, any questions on the, on the proposed recommendation? Hearing none, do I have a motion to accept? I move we accept the staff recommendation. Commissioner Mon, second. Seconded by Commissioner Pastore. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, continue Laurel on the amendments. Okay. This is the final um, proposed rulemaking item for voting today. It is a package deal that appears to be pretty complex. However, I can assure you it's very straightforward. Um, and to be right up front, the proposed amendments in this package are intended to clarify the regulations, but not modify currently prohibited or allowable activities. So if you go into it with that mindset that we're, we're seeking clarification in this one, um, the, uh, as you all probably remember, the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators held their national conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania last fall. And at that conference, the NASBLA membership, which consists of the boating law administrators from across the country, uh, voted to adopt a model act for safe boating practices for boat, towed, water sports. We have for quite some time wanted to um, amend our regulations relating to boat towed water sports and we're kind of waiting for NASPLA to take some action on model language that we could adopt. Um, so we have reviewed the um, portions of that model act that relate to um, boat towed water sports in Pennsylvania and we would like to incorporate and moder modernize our regulations. The proposed amendments include also a few corrections to some inconsistent wording relating to these changes 
And these, again, these proposed amendments are intended to clarify regulations, but not modify what's allowed or prohibited. The proposed amendments are on pages um, 51 through, I think, about 57 of your, or 55 of your um, agendas. And I've lumped them together into some summary bullets up here so we don't have to go through each and every one of them. I know you all have reviewed these before you came to the meeting, but here's the, the gist of it uh, for those who are following us on Facebook this afternoon. These amendments create new terms and definitions. The new terms are boat towed device and uh, boat towed water sports. And the reason I have that all inclusive in parentheses up there is that it's inclusive of water skiing, tubing, um, wake surfing, all types of activities where you are being towed behind a boat. Previously, we used the word term water skier or water ski or water skiing. And that was quite confusing to the public because it implied to the public that only those people who were on those two little water skis being towed across the water had to abide by these regulations. Now we're saying that it's all inclusive and it was actually intended to be all inclusive before, um, but this clarifies it uh, in a much better way. Um, so boat towed device and boat towed water sports apply to all those types of activities. Um, and those are the changes that you'll see throughout your agenda item in regard to 109.4A. We also, um, in this package, clarify the use of the term water ski. Again, it's not um, water ski used to be all inclusive, and now we've defined it to be just the act of riding on those two um, skis. And again, that's identified, or that's part of the 109.4A definition section. We've also um, used this package to correct the inconsistent use of hyphens throughout the um, code. Water ski, water skiing, and water skier were frequently, um, frequently contained hyphens and were, or not, and it was very inconsistent. So we cleaned that up. That's an administrative item, um, but that's throughout this package. Also, we found that there was an incorrect usage of the acronym um, PDF when it should have actually been PFD for personal flotation device in 109.4G. We're using this package of regulatory amendments also to apply maximum length to all boat towed water sport tow ropes. Previously, it said ski tow ropes, and we've made that all inclusive. That's in 109.4E. Um, also, for the safety of all boat towed water sport participants, um, there is the 100 foot operation restriction in 105.38, which says that um, other boats may not operate within 100 feet of those folks. And uh, we are clarifying the requirement for an observer for all boat towed water sports. Previ previously, it said only water skiers need observers. Um, so that's uh, the amendment you'll see in 105.18. And then there's about seven uh, county specific regulatory amendments here in chapter 111 um, that mention specifically water skiing, water, the number of devices, those types of uh, specific regulations relating to 109.4. So we've taken all of these amendments from 109.4 and integrated them into chapter 111 where, um, where they're relevant. So it is, again, a complete regulatory update to modernize the language of 109.4 and then insert those changes throughout the rest of the code um, as appropriate. Clarifying regulations, making some corrections, but not changing what's currently allowable or prohibited. Voting Advisory Board um, considered this and discussed it at the February 7th meeting, and we're fully supportive of it. Staff recommend the Commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the proposed amendments described in the commentary. And if adopted on final rulemaking, this would go into amendment, or I'm sorry, would go into effect January 1st of 2023. 
Okay. I believe so. <laughs> okay, any any other comments, questions for Laurel on this one? I get a couple of questions. Sure. On page um, 51 of the agenda, it really appears twice. Put it under 103.3A. It talks about staying 100 feet away from essentially things that are static, like a launch ramp, a down skier, a dock. But then we inserted for other boat towed water sport participants, which is somebody who's moving through the water. And, and so how you kind of have the same thing on the next page under 105.38, which says you can't operate with it. I can't operate a boat within 100 feet of a water skier. So I'm trolling three miles an hour and some water skier comes 60 feet away from me Technically, aren't I, you know, I'm now operating my boat within 100 feet of them, but I. I'm just trying to understand how you, how can, how can you even. Enforce this when you don't know where the water skier is going and, you know, I've seen them going. Kind of somewhat erratically and I'm you're driving your boat in a straight line and they are not going in a straight line. I can understand it if you're like approaching them or something, but I, I guess just as a practical matter, how. Is that enforceable? Well, I guess step one is should you really have that in this 103.3, which are really everything else here is essentially static and you know you shouldn't be within 100 feet of it, whereas you inserted something that's in motion just seems much harder to enforce that. It almost it's, seems like in, in many cases it would really be the water, the person operating the both that's pulling the water skier that ought to stay away as opposed to some other boat who I, I don't know where that person's going to go with the water ski, but I got to whatever, wherever they're going, I got to stay 100 feet away from. So I guess I just make that as an observation. I don't know. Well, I can respond to the 103 3 comment. Um, what we had intended to do there was. Um, to indicate that swimmers or down skiers or other boat towed water sport participants, meaning they're static. There's their swimmers, you know, they they don't move much. Um, down skiers are kind of, you know, they've come off their ski or off plane and they're static in the water. And downed boat towed water sport participants is really what's intended there. If you see where the semicolons are placed, it does group those three together, the swimmers, the down skiers, and the other boat towed water sport participants. So those would all be people who are now physically in the water as opposed to um, being actively towed or actively being towed. Um, so that is intended, the semicolons in that section are intended to kind of group those together. Does that make sense? Correct. Correct. Take the comma out then, because it's your. It sounds like three different things. You got swimmers or down skiers. Sure. Anybody else? Which toad, toad sure. Around. And then the second part of that that deals with enforcement. I think I might need to refer that to my friend in the back of the room, Colonel Clyde Warner. Sure, so it would be similar to other regulations. For instance, uh, whether it's 100 foot from shore, I mean, it basically would be an ops officer observation. Um, but like a lot of the, the existing regulations we have, you know, you have to have the right angle, you have to be in the right spot. It's, it can be difficult to assess that. Um, so not that it's impossible to enforce, but it, it, it can be difficult.
is there a similar, let's say I'm trolling at 3 miles an hour and somebody. Comes water skiing by 50 feet in front of me. The way I read this, like I'd be in violation because I'm operating a boat within 100 feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there any obligation on the part of the person drive? Uh, pulling the skier to to stay 100 feet away from me, or is is the responsibility only on part of the other operator? That's a good point. I mean, it's sorry, it's, not, it's a good it's point, not. and and you know probably. At the end of the day, probably a little bit on both. Um, but, you know, the other regulations that we have in place that have to do with distance, they're all pretty much, you know, while greater than slow and awake speed. So um, this one is unique that it's, it's not worded that way. Uh, you know, if there are two boats putting side by side, uh, you know, one's, you know, they're not going greater than slow and awake speed, then they're fine. But if, if one comes blowing by you 30 feet away, then of course that's a violation. So I just have one other question then. On um on page 52, section 105.3, number eleven. Maybe I'm just not understanding it correctly, but it's it seems like first it says can't operate it. Boat towed device device using a tow rope that's 20 feet or less. And the next sentence says it doesn't apply to boat towed water sports, which just seems like you're just reversing what you said in the first sentence. Because I think a boat towed device could be like a tube. And then, but it's also, and the prohibition seems to. So that, um, Commissioner Pastore, that caught me up also when I was reviewing this agenda item for today's meeting. And what that is, um, we are actually changing the, if you, if you look immediately below that chapter 109, see in all caps, it says specialty boats and, and then you see the bracket, water skiing activities, end of bracket, and then boat towed water sports. We're amending or re suggesting to amend the title of the chapter. And so the new chapter title is going to be specialty boats and boat towed water sports. So if you take that new chapter title and insert it there at the end of the sentence that you were just referring to, that's actually referring to the name of the chapter of 109.4. So, um, as defined in section 109.4 parenthesis relating to water skiing and other boat towed water sports, that is the name of the chapter that's being referenced. Okay. And, and it is very confusing the way it's laid out here. Okay, I get it. Yep, it, it caught me up as well. <laughs> it's just, it's referring to the section. The section title, correct. Yeah, it's just referring to the section. Or the chapter title, yes. Do we need to go back then to uh, amending, making a, yeah, amending the comma, a motion to amend the comma to make this official? Oh, I know that. I didn't know if you needed to add it first. Hmm? Yeah. I'll make that motion. Amend the comma. Second. But, okay, Don. But there was some proposed. No one. Did anybody, did anybody move the package yet? No, but I thought we'd amend it first and then move to make the pack. Bob. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In, in this. I have noted such. <laughs> right. There we go. All right. Let's let's move it to the floor for a vote to 
accept the staff recommendation. <laughs> Commissioner Hussar, seconded by Commissioner Gibney. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you. But, uh, and, and also for our folks out in Facebook, I, I know you made mention to the our summary book and where the fire extinguishers were, but new to this year is the entire handbook found on page 40 for boating. And just to remind everyone that's listening and, and joining with us that that is a great resource and it's in your summary book. If you're looking for the separate book, it's that we always had prior to this. It's now in your handbook and I think it's really a helpful, helpful tool. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll turn it over to Colonel Warner. So let's back, be back here at um, 25 minutes before three o'clock. Take a break. All right, we're back to our, after our break and back to the meeting. And I don't need to, everybody's attentive. Okay, we'll turn the podium over to Colonel Warner for our final rulemaking on some law enforcement issues. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Law enforcement has one item for final rulemaking. That'll be amendments to 58 code 63.8, longbows, crossbows, spears, and gigs. For a brief overview, we're gonna talk about lighting use for bow fishing, noise restrictions, bow fishing in special rig trout waters, and then we'll show you the uh, proposed amendments. These are some of the different types of equipment that are utilized uh, in the bow fishing sport. A um, couple different boats, uh, some setups there with the bow. Just a couple more examples of the equipment that is utilized. So the Bureau of Law Enforcement has received feedback on this section from commission staff, property owners, anglers, fishing guides, and legislators. Um, changes are needed to reduce the growing number of conflicts occurring on Commonwealth waters. The lighting used for bow fishing. Uh, bow fishing anglers use extremely intense lighting to locate fish. The number one complaint that the Bureau gets regarding bow fishing is the shining of these lights upon structures close to the waterways at all hours of the night. Staff proposes to add a section making it unlawful to cast direct rays of a spotlight, headlight, or any other artificial light from a watercraft upon any occupied buildings or another watercraft. And this is language is similar to what's in the Game of Wildlife Code for recreational spotlighting. Noise restrictions, uh, once again, bow fishing anglers on occasion use generators to operate the lighting used on watercraft to locate fish. The Bureau of Law Enforcement receives complaints regarding the loud generators being used at all hours of the night by bow fishermen. Staff proposed that a section making it unlawful to use generators on board a watercraft engaged in bow fishing that exceeds a noise level of 90 decimals. The noise emission test measure will be made with a sound level meter at a distance of at least four feet above the water at a point where the transom gunnel and the port or starboard gunnel intersects. The 90 decimal limit proposed is a current standard for motorboats with engines manufactured before January 1, 1993 as listed in the current regulations. And the testing procedure outlined is presently used by commission officers. Bow fishing and special regulation trout waters. Uh, we would like to clarify bow fishing spears and gigs are not authorized devices to use in all special regulation trout waters. Uh, this change will help reduce any potential conflicts between anglers and bow fishing anglers in special regulation trout waters. Staff proposed to add a section making it unlawful to allow bow fishing or the use of spears and gigs in all special regulation trout waters. And basically, these are the uh, the changes. 
you'll see number one is unlawful use bow and arrow, including compound bows and crossbows, spears and gigs, and any special regulation trout water. Number two, it is unlawful to cast direct rays of a spotlight, mounted headlight, or any other artificial light of any kind from a watercraft upon any occupied building or another watercraft. And number three, unlawful to use generators on board a watercraft engaged in bow fishing with a noise level that exceeds 90 decimals. Uh, it goes on to explain how the testing procedure will be done with a sound level meter at a distance of four feet above the water at a point where the transom gunnel and the porter starboard gunnel intersects. The Law Enforcement Committee considered this proposal on December 15th, 2021 and recommended the commission approve the publication as a notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, public comment period um, was established March 12th to 2022. Uh, commission received a total of 34 public comments regarding the proposal with one in support of 29 opposed and four that did not pertain. Recommendation, the staff recommend that the commission adopt the amendment as set forth in the notice of proposed rulemaking. If adopted, the amendment will go into effect upon publication in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Okay, thank you. Question. Questions, comments? Here we go, Charlie. Um, Colonel, the, the first question is, can we separate each one of these three and vote on them separately, or do we have to vote on them in mass? I would expect that would be a question for our legal folks. Yeah, I'm not for all of them, but I am for some of them. I'm just saying that I can't vote positively on all three. I, there's one part of the uh, exceptions that I don't agree with. And I just I need some clarification whenever we're done here on number two. On on when you say number two. Uh, Except 63 AD paragraph 2, it's unlawful to oh. cast direct rays, a spotlight. Um, I, well, I'm waiting for the, the other thought is go ahead. This case, say for whatever setting, yes for one, two, yes for one, three, and three is great. Here's what the other case tells us. Today, I'm not to know when you won't hear it. Is there, is there any thought by the other commissioners about tabling this and getting more information? Yeah, I've been thinking about that, uh, Charlie. This is Commissioner Lewis, and um, the only thing is, I I don't want to table this for a year. But, but was uh, I was moved by the comments that the bow fishing community made. Quite frankly, I appreciated the fact that you explained to us what your concerns were. But I'm not. This is the second or third meeting we brought this up at, 
So I would be uh, uh, in favor of voting on one, two, or three of these things and tabling the other two till the July meeting and then do an up or down vote in July. Well, I have a question on number two. Does that apply to all our voting? Do we have that regulation on, on any type of vessel up there? As far as spotlighting houses? No. So we don't? No. And Okay, so this would be new. It would apply to bow hunters, but other vessels it would not apply to. Well, the, no, the okay. difference there is that you can't use a spotlight under motion, right? Well, you can't display another. So if you're out, you're not supposed to display any other lights other than a navigational light. So somebody that's throwing on a spotlight is in violation. Unless uh, the, the one exception we do have is for docking lights. Go ahead, Wayne. So this, this actually clarifies that they can use the Wayne, Wayne has a comment. In response to Commissioner Lewis's comment, I do not think it'd be possible to vote on portions of the ruling other things. Then we would be left with another avenue or we could publish what got voted on, but we have to start. Seeing that you guys included in your analysis. See, they've gone around a couple of times. I know you for a lot of time. Uh, yeah, that is that's true. Um, so, w from the initial proposals, um, which were pro were considerably too restrictive, in my opinion. So we pared it down to the issues that are addressing the complaints. Um, so shining light on houses, I mean, obviously no one wants that done, uh, but we, it also takes into consideration that incidental lighting of houses is not a violation. So reflection off the water, um, if, you know, you move the boat, whatever, that's not a violation. So that mirrors the game code. Uh, presently under the game code, you can't shine a light on forester fields after 11 o'clock anyway. So it's similar to the other portion of the boat code that you can't use lights under motion. No, but here to the game code. No, but it's our, but, but someone could get cited under the game law for shining lights in somebody's driveway or in the yard or, in, you know. It's a yeah, so this, this, this corresponds now to other laws that are already in existence. I just have it, I just, you know, applies to these there's boats. Okay. This is Commissioner Lewis, there's one other factor here that we need to be aware of, and that is that we feel that if we don't do something about this, that the the legislature may want to do something itself, and we would prefer that that to happen. I presume we would like to sh to fix this in our in, in our purview. That's all. Don has a point. Thank you. And I, I listened to Mr. Weber's commentary this morning here, and I think he made some good points. In number two, and I'd ask this of our our legal team here: Would we be better to ward that? It is unlawful to intentionally cast and repeated or and or repeatedly repeatedly cast uh, the rays of a spotlight, mounted headlight, or any other artificial light of any kind, so on, 
Should we add those those words to number two, Wayne? Uh, would I, that I, make would that make things better there in that? Uh, I I do not know if it would make it better if you add in and then the word intentional, then officers and ultimately a magistrate has to determine what is intentional, what is unintentional. It's not typically how we draft our regulations. We don't normally care whether you intend to do something. If you catch three fish when you should only have two, that's what we care about. We don't care whether you intended to catch two, but accidentally caught three. Um, it's, it's not that we don't do it on occasion, but um, I I can't say this afternoon without talking to law enforcement. What in, inserting an intention into this regulation would mean for for enforcement? Well, I from this uh, gentleman's comments earlier today, uh, you know. I, be honest with you, I, I panic every time I see them. a bow fisherman coming up and flashy while trout stream. But I never, I never thought about shooting the suckers and, and the part that are sometimes in there. Uh, I'd like to know more, more information, and then immediately act on it at the next fisheries meeting or law enforcement, whichever one. Uh, so that we don't, we don't make this last forever. Uh, I think that uh, Don's suggestion of repeatedly, not unintentionally, but repeatedly, I mean, if they do it two or three times, that's repeatedly, whether they do it intentionally or not, that one word might be helpful repeatedly. Can I make a comments? Right in. Got a bunch of, let me just throw them out there. For, for, for this time. <laughs> so, number one, I guess, is this actually an issue? So, it, is there actually some problem we're trying to solve on paragraph number one? Is there some concern about bow fishing and special regulation marks for shooting trout? Is it really a problem that needs to be fixed? I guess my second comment. I don't read this section two as if you're not allowed to have shine a light on a boat other than your running bites. That's that's it doesn't say you're allowed to do it if you're spear fishing, but you can't do something else. You know, why doesn't it just it seems to me like if we're gonna prohibit you from shining a light from a boat, it should just apply to everything. Who cares? Whether you're spear fishing or you're just whatever you're doing, no boater should be allowed to do this. And if you're not allowed to have a boat, we would need an exception to say you're allowed to run these lights when you're bow fishing. The last point I've got is on paragraph three, if we're taking this language directly from measuring a decibel level on a motor. It's not directly applicable because you're you're defining where you're going to take the measurement as this intersection. The motor is always going to be not there. Very rarely is the motor going to be at the intersection of the side of the boat and the transom. Motors in the middle of the transom. You're taking a measurement over here, but now you're you're using that same definition, and you could actually have the generator sitting there. <clears throat> Seems to me like you should say it's on the on that section that is opposite where the generator is, or not at the generator. Unless that's not what you and what if the generator is sitting on right there in that one of the corners? Can you take it there? Do you have to take it at the other corner? I just think you took a definition that kind of works because the motor's in the middle, and you applied it to something like a generator that might be actually at that point where you're trying to take the motor. So the, those are just 
Boy, Collins, thanks. In, in light of the public comments, in light of some of our reservations in, in terms and whatever, you know, I I would like to propose that we would table this again. And I know I hate to do that, but I, I think we need to get it right. I think we need to um, respect comments that we get in the public and from the uh, gentleman that's here with us today and it's still back there. And you want a motion to that effect? Before any motion is offered, do you, there are generally two options when, when tabling. One is to table indefinitely, which then leaves it open as to when it comes back. Or one is to table uh, it to a date certain. And the motion should include the date certain, which could be another meeting, another committee meeting, or anything else that I'm not thinking of. I'd like to suggest to the July meeting. They would like to not have a go longer than that. I I agree. I I don't think we should drag this out long term, but I just feel it needs tweaked a little bit here, uh, and that with some of the commentary we heard today from from Mr. Weber and some of the other public comments. So I guess the question is, where does that tweaking take place? Well, we should probably have a law enforcement committee meeting before the next. Commission meeting in July. I'll make a motion that we we table this until the July commission meeting. And that the law enforcement committee meet and re review it with law enforcement staff and. Uh, we uh, change some wording here that. Would be acceptable to, I think, all the commissioners. Okay. I'll second the motion. Okay. Got a motion from Commissioner Anderson, seconded by Commissioner Lewis. Any discussion? I just have one. There was also some public comment about species that could be targeted. Was that a summer? Oh, was that? Was that? Um, Happy in this section, or would that be somewhere else? I thought it was. Didn't we have that on the first iteration? It was last. I don't see it in this. I my rec my thoughts on that. I I feel we ought to just let that alone for the time being. We could come back at some later date if we felt that need to needed to be addressed then and we could amend the regulation then if if snakeheads would become further i guess i want to say more more established uh, in a greater area throughout pa or a greater population of them of staff our fisheries staff would would That's see that they're more of a problem we could we could we could look at that as a, a different, a separate issue done at a later date, and maybe include that. That, that is correct, Mr. President. Um, the um, the existing uh, regulation provide provides that uh, bows, uh, crossbow spears, etc., can be used uh, to uh, fish for carp, suckers, catfish. I think that's all of them. Uh, doesn't address both in uh, our, our snakehead at all. The proposed rulemaking as published did not address those. Uh, on final rulemaking, we are restricted to amendments that do not expand the scope of the original proposal. Since the original proposal doesn't deal with species, rather more it's geared towards methods. I do not think it, it uh, my, my opinion this afternoon, but it could change. But my opinion this afternoon is it's not within the scope of the original proposal to talk about species. That would be better dealt with as a new proposed rulemaking. Thank you for that clarification. So we'll stick to the amendment that was presented. 
and excuse me, the recommendation that was presented. We have a motion that was moved and seconded on making and tabling it till the July meeting. All those in favor of tabling the motion that was made, or the, <laughs> all those in favor of the motion was made to table the recommendation, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We'll point that to the law enforcement committee and deal with that other one's a second separate issue. Good. Thank you for your patience, Clyde. No, not a I'll problem. Go to not the next problem. section, please. Yep. So that would be under proposed rulemaking. The next, the next slide. So we have three, uh, three items for proposed rulemaking, uh, and all of these came out of our northwest region and have some ties to the steelhead runs, although they're obviously applicable across the Commonwealth. The first one we're going to talk about is amendment to 63.5, methods of fishing. Uh, like I said, it was requested by the WCOs, and it's generally an issue uh, during the steelhead run in the fall. Dealing with illegal methods of fishing currently in the rig, uh, if they do not actually catch any fish or take any fish, there's really no avenue for us. So what the amendment's going to show here once we go through some slides, and as you can see with the first set of photos, uh, those nets and illegal devices can be very, very effective. What the officers are requesting at times, they get in individuals that are in the creeks with nets, maybe the flows are a little bit higher, they're not able to net fish, but they're actively out there attempting to take them by nets or whatever illegal device. So they would like uh, to clean up this section and add the or attempt to take fish uh, from waters of the Commonwealth, and that will certainly aid them. I'm sure it has applications across the Commonwealth where walleye are spawning and so on, uh, but it's definitely an issue in the northwest part of the state. So staff recommends the commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the amendment described in the commentary. If approved on final rulemaking, the amendment will go into effect upon publication in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Okay, are there any, any questions, comments in regard to this? Okay, Commissioner Anderson made a motion to accept it. Is there a second? Commissioner Gibney no. seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Okay. Going to foul hooking, snag fishing, snatch fishing. Yep. The next section we're going to talk about is 63.9, snatch fishing, foul hooking, and snag fishing. And um, th this, this proposal here kind of revolves around what's commonly called trout beads. Um, we're going to show you some, some different examples of the equipment. Uh, the proposed regulation amendment and a brief summary. So these are some of the devices that were in question, and this was something that was brought to our attention by, by several anglers from the Lake Erie area. It's a very popular way to, to fish for steelhead and salmon. Uh, just some, some different, uh, different examples of the equipment there. We would like to add subsection C that states nothing in this se section will prohibit the use of a device so long as the hook is no more than two inches below the device. Uh, currently, there's some question whether or not bead fishing in the past, and I could not find any other uh, techniques or devices uh, other than the trout beads that fit this section. Uh, but. There's some confusion out there. It seems like anglers aren't sure whether they can use them, can't use them. Are they legal? Are they not? This will uh, tighten that up and, and spell it out pretty specifically, I think. So in summary, the, we've received com comments from fishermen asking for clarification on the legality of devices 
uh, where the hook is below the bait slash lure. Uh, and once, like I indicated, an example of this type of device would be trout beads. Recommendation staff recommends that the commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the amendment described in the commentary. If approved on final rulemaking, the amendment will go into effect upon publication in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Any comments, questions on this recommendation? Go ahead, Dan. A oh. couple things. One is I know we talked about this at the committee meeting, and I, I think there are other devices that are not trout beads where the hook dangles below whatever the, the lure is, like a, I don't know if you know what a halley jig is. It's like a metal jig, and it has a chain that hangs, and it has a treble. So this type of device where, or you have a trailer hook, that J plug is another one, but where the, the hooks, you know, hang below the device. And so this is, I think this is probably a better way of addressing it than specifying for just trout beads. I, we just use that as an example. Obviously we, we rewarded it to include any other devices that were of similar design? So the only other comment I'd have is, should we define what part of the hook? Do you mean two inches from the eye of the hook or the bend of the hook? I assume you mean the eye of the hook, but it doesn't really say that. What? The, the eye of the hook is part of the hook. So within two inches of the eye would be within Two inches of the of the hook. Um, if you're, if you want to argue, it's from two inches from the the the, the bar. Well, that's that's fine too. It, it'd be much closer, but I think uh, at worst case scenario, it's from the from the or the most liberal interpretation. It's from the eye, and I think that's the intent here. Um, should we say that? I mean, the whole point of this is to create some clarity. Should we just add eye of the eye of the hook? Just I mean, the whole reason we're passing this is so people understand what they can and they can't do. And it'd be a shame if somebody got cited trying to make the argument that it was at the at the elbow of the hook rather than the eye of the hook. You could have a hook that's this long. So that was the point of that. Not it's not as a snagging technique. It's not a snagging technique. These are dead drifted through the water underneath a, a strike indicator. John, well, I have a question. Would this would this wording would that make uh, say a worm harness? That would it make that illegal? I mean, you'd make the trout anglers happy, but you'd make Oh, walleye. And I'm not a walleye fisherman, so I can't really answer that. No, I, I how how it's how rigged. It would confuse. The worm harness is the two hooks with all the beads and the okay. uh, the blade. So is that is that second hook? 
I, as long the as second that hook, and maybe even the first hook sometimes, you know, it depends on how many beads they put and how many. But it's, is, is it still within the warm or the, the bait, so to speak? I guess this is the, the, the purpose of this, I think, was to, you know, that we weren't having, you know, bare hooks hanging, you know, too far below right. the yeah. device, the bait, the lure, whatever you want to call it. It's that's that's how the current law is written, right? Where I mean, the intent was the the fish is going to bite the item that has the hook in it. So, so the initial and, and once again, I'm a fly fisherman, but I've never used trout beads before. Uh, I, I I think when you look at the the regulation, the concern from the officers and the confusion with the public was, or, or the. The mindset is a lot of times the fish is hooked on the outside of the mouth. So they were concerned with using that device. Um, but I've since been educated and, and uh, you know, that doesn't seem to be the case as long as we don't have too big a distance. Those crawler harnesses I'm familiar with, they're usually running them with like a night crawler. Right. So I think the bait would be on the hook. Are you? I know I'm just used to how they do them on Lake Erie. I don't like use them in inland water. I mean, do they sometimes fish them without any, any bait on the hooks? No. Because I think if, as long as a worm was on a crawler or something, yep. like that, then you're, yep. the Maybe bait good. is actually fun. Yep. yep, absolutely. Yes, I believe in that situation, this, this is, that would be legal because the bait is on the hook. The question on uh, adding, uh, so long as the eye of the hook is no more than two inches below the device, that uh, does not change the intent of the uh, the, pro the proposal. So that would be an acceptable uh, amendment. And, and again, I apologize for not being on that meeting. This was did you discuss other species? Everything. Or wasn't just steelhead utilizing. Trout, well, it's trout. 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 That's what my point is. Yeah. Right? yeah, I know what they are, Bill. I've I've seen them. I've held them. Yeah. I mean, you probably used them last. No. 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 They're illegal in Montana, so they are legal in Alaska. Yeah. And so the fish takes here, right. and you slip you hook. You often can wind up out on, on, right. on the outside. Yeah. Of the They're very effective. Yeah. No, it's yeah, it's steelhead stuff and salmon. I, I'm just thinking about wild trout. How, you know, how that may affect fishery, but it's talking out loud here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to the recommendation. So, Wayne, you said if if we would insert that once we make a motion to um, to to amend this by putting that wording in, or we just make an edit. Okay, Bill Brock, make that motion. Make that motion. Okay. 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 The motion is on the floor to accept the recommendation with putting inserting the eye of the hook by Commissioner Brock. Is there a second? Commissioner Small seconded the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Motion carried. All right. And next, um, recognized fish cleaning stations. 
Colonel Warner. Okay, so the last uh, item we have here uh, is 6315A, which deals with officially recognized fish cleaning stations. Once again, this was a request uh, by the WCOs. Uh, they're requesting that the skin remain on the flays to assist in identification of the fish that are harvested and processed at officially recognized non-commercial fish cleaning stations throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, this proposed language would make that much easier. These are just some examples and a picture of our beautiful new fish cleaning station at Walnut Creek. Obviously, for the officers, if we just have a fish fillet with no skin on it, it's very difficult to tell what type, uh, how many. We'll get into some of the... Uh, what we're looking to do is add subsection E, that officially recognized fish cleaning station users shall leave at least a two inch by two inch piece of skin on the processed fillet for identification purpose, purposes. Cutting of the fillets into pieces, also known as chunking, is prohibited. Once again, it lets us identify the fish and how many they would have by prohibiting the chunking. Adding this language would make it much easier for us to, to check what species they're processing at the cleaning stations, and it would also limit the time officers would need to conduct identification of fish fillets, providing better customer service. Recommendation, staff recommend that the commission approve the publication of a notice of proposed rulemaking containing the amendment described in the commentary. If approved on final rulemaking, the amendment will go into effect upon publication in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Okay, any questions or comments on this proposal? I have a question. Darling? Uh, are we gonna have signage available there that it's gonna let them know what the changes are? Well, I would, I would definitely would look to our, you're in charge of fish cleaning stations, aren't you? <laughs> we will definitely make sure there's signage there, yes. Any further comments or questions? Okay, thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Is there a second? Commissioner Charlesworth, a second in the motion. Any further comment? I'll just have a comment that at the committee meeting, I think the original proposal was to leave the skins on completely. And after some comments, I, you know, John made one that you're really only half cleaning the fish at that point. You're going to have to take it home, and now you got to skin them all. But you're really kind of under undermining some of the value of that. So I think this was a, a nice compromise to, to requiring leaving all the skin. Thank you, Dan. That's that was an important important point that John made at the committee meeting. Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Clyde. <laughs> All right, we're nearing the end of the day. President Kaufman, before we proceed to new business, I need your indulgence to correct an item. Uh, earlier in the meeting, I made an announcement of a temporary change to fishing regulations, and I read the wrong uh, bulletin notice. So the actual notice that went out was put out on Saturday, March 26, 2022, regarding temporary change to fishing regulations at Walnut Creek Marina Basin in Erie County. The details are in Exhibit A. I just read the wrong text. Thank you, Wayne, for that correction. Appreciate that. Is there any other new business to bring before the board?
Thank you, Eric. Thanks for sharing that through that. Anything else to bring before the board? Any comments from Director Schaefer? If <laughs> um, as you can see on the screen, our next commission meeting will be here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, hold the dates of July 25th and 26th. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their input, their um, dedication to what they do, both the staff and the commissioners. Thank the public for joining us and, and have them be assured, the folks that are listening on Facebook, we do pay attention to those comments. I think some of our discussions reflected that today. Um, and um, we, you know, we as a, as a board, I'm very proud to represent the board here, but I know as a board, and we all have a passion to do what's right and to do what's best for the Commonwealth and our fishery. So uh, Richard has a comment. Just, the the meeting is the twenty fifth and twenty sixth and and the twenty fourth will will discuss yes yes that's separate sure okay if there's no other comments do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting Eric second it I can I can all those in favor of the meeting adjourned. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.